Notwithstanding the demand and supply shocks to Africa's trade, however, there is also a brighter side. At the African Development Bank, we believe that implementation of the Continental Free Trade Area, the AFCFTA, could lead the COVID-19 recovery efforts. If implemented, the Continental Trade Deal could reduce not only the exposure on trade and investment issues, but also future shocks associated with pandemics, food supply, health, social and economic disparities, as well as regional shocks in supply chains. As it is often said, in the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. The COVID-19 pandemic has created a global crisis. However, it has also presented catalytic opportunities for the AFCFTA to strengthen and reconfigure intra-African supply chains, enhance resilience, improve infrastructure and health systems, as well as reducing reliance on non-African trading partners. COVID-19 also forces us to revisit our values, reconsider our priorities and redesign strategies and sustainability activities through targeted investments. The COVID-19 storm will pass, but the choices we make today are very, very critical. The post-COVID-19 phase certainly calls for the retooling, resetting, and restarting of trade while promoting investments within the context of the AFCFTA. The Continental Trade Deal promises to deliver transformation if well implemented, and that's the overarching objective of the AFCFTA. Today, we are all here to discuss at this webinar just what kind of opportunities and prospects can be uncovered to help accelerate intra-African trade and investments during and after the pandemic through the AFCFTA. As the title suggests, COVID-19 is a catalyst for accelerating trade and investments on the continent. Before and after the outbreak of the pandemic, the bank's support to the AFCFTA has been to sustain reforms and modernization of trade facilitation institutions with the goal of reducing cost of doing business to economic operators. We are also advising and supporting our member countries with technical assistance on national implementation planning, institutional preparedness, and functional capacities to comply with the AFCFTA regulations. Complementary measures include streamlining non-tariff measures and elimination of barriers, as well as through trade finance. The bank believes that improving the investment and business climate and advancing competitiveness through better competition policies is critical for enhancing the ecosystem for the implementation of the AFCFTA. In conclusion, Africa needs immediate, innovative and accelerated, accelerated response to the pandemic to develop differently. The AFCFTA will not in one dramatic swoop alter existing commercial and economic realities on a vast scale. However, through deliberate strategic measures and the right investments, policy frameworks and political will, intra-African trade will be enhanced. What are those choices that we have to make? What are those mechanisms that we have to work with? What are those specific investments that we have to make? I believe that the answers to these questions will be comprehensively addressed today by the distinguished speakers that we have lined up today. Once again, I thank you all for honoring our invitation and look forward to your active participation. A special thank you and call out to our partners in this, the Korea Customs Service for partnering with us to host this webinar. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Abdul, thank you very much for that opening address. And I think we're going to underpin all of the conversations today by that statement that in the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. It, it is now my pleasure to introduce Sukwon Ro, who's the commissioner of the Korean Customs Service, to give his opening statement via video.
안녕하십니까 관제청장 노석환입니다. 아프리카 지역의 정부와 공공기관 그리고 민간기업에서 이번 온라인 세미나에 참석하신 기빈 여러분 그리고 오늘 이 회의를 준비해 주신 아프리카 개발은행 관계자 여러분께 깊은 감사의 말씀을 전합니다. 저는 한국관제청이 아프리카 개발은행과 함께 이번 온라인 세미나를 개최하게 되어 매우 기쁘게 생각합니다. 코로나19는 1년도 되지 않은 기간 동안 전 세계인의 보건과 일상생활을 완전히 바꿔 놓았습니다. 특히 아프리카를 포함한 전 세계의 방역 조치로 인해 지역 간 국가 간의 인적 물적 교류가 급격히 위축되었습니다. UN 무역개발회의는 코로나로 아프리카 GDP가 평균 1.4%, 최대 7.8%까지 감소할 것이라고 예측했으며 아프리카 전체 수출도 16.7%가 감소될 것으로 예측합니다. 이러한 위기를 극복하고 글로벌 경제가 지속적으로 성장하려면 물류는 멈추지 않아야 합니다. 과거 각국 정부의 주요 정책 목표가 무역 원활화와 무역 안전이었는데 이젠 무역의 지속성을 추가해야 합니다. 중단 없는 원활한 무역을 위해 사람의 개입을 최소화해 무역 환경 전반을 전선하고 물리적 검사를 축소하는 등 비대면 관세 행정 서비스를 확대해야 합니다. 이러한 측면에서 세계 각국은 ICT 신기술과 빅데이터를 활용한 무역 시스템 구축에 과감히 투자해야 할 필요가 있습니다. 관세와 무역 환경 고도화는 궁극적으로 무역과 투자를 촉진하고 지속성을 강화해 현재 닥친 경제적 위기를 기회로 바꿀 수 있다고 생각합니다. 한국관세청은 이러한 관세 행정 현대화 경험을 아프리카 지역과 공유하기 위해 많은 노력을 기울여 왔습니다. 2012년부터 탄자니아, 카메룬, 이디오피아, 가나, 나이제리아, 알제리, 모리셔스, 수단, 가봉, 티니지 등 10개국을 대상으로 관세 행정 현황을 진단하고 미래 모형을 구축하는 세간 현대화 컨설팅 을 사업을 실시했습니다. 2016년부터는 매년 아프리카 지역의 관세 행정 최고위급 인사를 초청해 관세 분야의 ICT 비전을 공유하는 무역 원활화 정책 세미나를 개최해 왔습니다. 지난해에는 아프리카 개발은행과 전자통관 기술 협력을 내용으로 하는 양자 외교각서를 체결해 아프리카 지역에 대한 관세 행정 현대화 협력 사업을 보다 활성화하기 위해 노력하고 있습니다. 한국관세청은 탄자니아, 에디오피아, 카메론, 가나, 알지리 등의 전자통관 시스템 구축에도 적극 협력하고 있습니다. 특히 지난 6월에 있었던 가나와 카메론의 전자통관 시스템 개통은 코로나19로 인해 국가 간 이동이 통제된 상황에서 비대면 원격 개발을 이룬 성과였습니다. 카메론의 전자통관 시스템 캄시스 개통식에서 루이 볼 모타즈 카메론 재무장관께서는 유니패스는 비대면 시대의 새로운 기회라고 언급하신 바 있습니다. 이와 같은 비대면 원격 개발 경험은 한국과 아프리카 회원국들의 소중한 자산으로서 앞으로도 계속 활용하고 발전시켜 나갈 것입니다. 향후 시스템 고도화의 핵심은 빅데이터와 신기술이 될 것입니다. 각 세간 당국은 통관, 무역 빅데이터를 보유하고 있는 각국의 대표적인 기관입니다. 이는 향후 AI 등 신기술 활용을 위한 잠재적이라고, 잠재력이라고 생각합니다. 한국관세청은 이러한 신기술을 관세 행정에 활용하기 위해 노력하고 있습니다. 특히 AI 기반의 우음 화물 선별 기술을 통관 절차에 적응해 좋은 성과를 내고 있으며 AI 엑스레이, AI 품목 분류 등 여러 분야에서 신기술 적용 가능성을 검증하는 연구개발 사업을 활발하게 추진하고 있습니다. 또한 한국관세청은 WCO와 바꾸다 프로젝트를 추진해 회원국들의 빅데이터 활용을 지원하고 있습니다. 이 프로젝트에서 개발한 저가 신고 탐지 알고리즘을 나이제리아에서 테스트한 결과 저가 신고 적발률이 현저히 높아짐을 확인할 수 있었습니다. 한국은 앞으로 아프리카 국가들과 신기술을 활용한 시스템 고도화의 결실을 함께 나누고자 합니다. 역사적으로 위기 상황에서 새로운 도전을 통해 기회를 고착한 국가 기업이 번영해 왔습니다. 이번 온라인 세미나를 통해 참가자들이 아프리카의 무역과 투자를 촉진할 수 있는 아이디어를 얻는 좋은 기회가 되기를 바랍니다. 아울러 코로나19 상황이 호전되면 여러분들을 직접 만나 의견을 나눌 수 있는 기회가 더 많아지길 희망합니다. 다시 한번 회의에 참석해 주신 기빈 여러분, 그리고 회의를 준비해 주신 아프리카 개발은행 관계자 여러분께 감사드립니다. 경청해 주셔서 감사합니다.
I'm sure you'll agree with me that it's fantastic to see the Korea Customs Service and the African Development Bank coming together to drive this thought leadership platform around trade and investment across the African continent. Now we're going into our first dynamic session and earlier we heard Abdul Mukta refer to retool, reset, restart. So moving from crisis to trade and investment opportunities, drawing from COVID-19, lessons learned and taking the opportunity to retool for the implementation of the African continental free trade area. Right, so the moderator we have for the session is Stephen Karangizi, who is the Director, African Legal Support Facility. And he is joined on his panel by the Honorable Robert Akumka Lindsay, who is the Deputy Minister of Trade and Industry of Ghana. Trudy Hudsonberg, who's Executive Director, Trade Law Council. Mr. Kenneth Bagamuhundra, who is the Director General Customs and Trade of the East Africa Community Secretariat, and Ms. Annabel Gonzalez, who's a fellow at Peterson Institute for International Economics. Stephen, I'm handing over to you to drive your moderation for the next 45 minutes, and we certainly look forward to hearing the thought leadership from your experts. Thank you very much, Browning, um, for the introduction. As um, our, our host and master of ceremonies has indicated, our topic today focuses on retool, reset, restart. From crisis to trade and investment opportunities, drawing lessons and insights from COVID-19 as opportunities to retool for the implementation of the African continental free trade area. And as she has indicated, I am glad to have an eminent panel, uh, which uh, is representative of the whole continent and some old friends uh, from different spheres. So we will try to give each uh, speaker at least uh, seven to eight minutes so that we shall have some spare time, hopefully for some questions and discussion. With that, I, I have the honor to invite the Honorable Robert Ahomka Lindsay, the Deputy Minister of Trade and Industry of Ghana to start his uh, <clears throat> intervention and give us his perspective on the subject uh, at hand. Honorable Minister. Just to ask, is he connected? I don't see him connected. So I will go to the next speaker for now. Um, uh, Ms. Trudy Hasenberg, Executive Director, Trade Law Center, Tralac. Uh, uh, kindly, I have the honor to invite you to give us your perspective and uh, we shall take it from there. If the Honorable Minister joins us later, we shall bring him in. Please, Trudy, you are welcome. Thank you very much, Stephen, for the introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to join you for this important conversation. COVID-19 has impacted all of our lives and also the life of the African continental free trade area as it abruptly brought the negotiations, which were at a critical point to a standstill for some time until we could reconfigure adopting digital solutions to conclude this very important process as we prepare to start trading under this regime on the 1st of January, 2020. I would like to share with you some thoughts on the African continental free trade area and how we can leverage this important continental trade and integration initiative for Africa's sustainable development. Ladies and gentlemen, some of the important lessons that you and I and all fellow Africans and our global citizen partners have learned from COVID is that we are all interdependent. And interdependence on the African continental, on the African continent is of course, particularly important. It makes our trade and integration agenda all the more important 
as we plan for recovery, resilience, and transformation post-pandemic. But it is Should also highlighted... I am going to just interject uh, just to allow our audience um, to know that the Honorable Deputy Minister of Trade and Industry of Ghana is actually linked. He is having some technical problems. So I just wanted to alert the audience to the fact that the minister is with us. Apologies for interjecting, Trudy. Please take it away and we will resolve the technical issue that uh, the minister is experiencing shortly. Thanks so much, Bronwyn, for that. Ladies and gentlemen, the vulnerabilities and marginalization which have existed pre-COVID have also been under a very harsh spotlight during the pandemic. And we've seen border communities, informal traders, youth, women, and other marginalized communities bearing the brunt of this pandemic. We've also learned, and I think this is particularly important as we plan for a post-recovery transformation of our African continent on the back of and leveraged by the African continental free trade area, the importance of developing and diversifying our productive capacity. And this is important in agriculture, as we have seen food security vulnerabilities being highlighted by the pandemic. It is, of course, equally important as we take a look at the industrialization imperative where we reduce our dependence on imports and increase our capacity to produce goods and services competitively to boost intra-Africa trade. But we've also seen in particular the importance of services sectors. And it was not a surprise that some of our member states negotiating the AFCFTA have brought to the table a proposal to add to the list of our priority services sectors education and healthcare, which will be fundamental to our recovery and transformation. Indeed, if we take a look at the WTO trade report for 2020, which was just released this week, analysts are arguing that education and healthcare are fundamental to industrialization. But very importantly too, and what we're doing currently is evidence of that, there has been a pandemic push towards digitization and could leverage these opportunities to best advantage in terms of implementing the AFCFTA, adopting digital trade solutions, but also transforming the way we work, the way we produce, the way we consume, the way we interact with one another. The African continental free trade area, ladies and gentlemen, creates a new trade and integration reality for our continent. It marks a watershed in terms of this long and complex process of integrating unequal partners on the continent. It recognizes explicitly that existing regional economic communities will continue to exist. So we have to take a look at this growing ecosystem of integration initiatives. But very importantly, and related to the discussion around investment, what we have seen already, even before we start trading under the AFCFTA, ladies and gentlemen, is global interest in Africa and in the AFCFTA reaching very important heights. Interest not only in terms of negotiating new partnerships for a future trade and development relationship, but also from private investors who see the opportunity of the AFCFTA as an extremely attractive one for new market frontiers to explore and to develop. Of course, foreign investment is absolutely critical to making the AFCFTA deliver development outcomes. So the question then is, where is the COVID-19 dividend and how do we find it in the AFCFDA? And ladies and gentlemen, I want to move a little bit away from a discussion about the AFCFDA as a free trade area and recognize very importantly that the AFCFDA is also one of the African Union's flagship projects alongside some 14, 15 others. And it is in this context that I would like to take a look at some of the dividends 
that we can leverage from the pandemic to make the AFCFTA deliver sustainable development outcomes. This is just a depiction of some of the other very important flagship projects. PEDA, Program for Infrastructure Development for Africa, in a 21st century digital economy, that of course takes on new significance. And in addition to the roads, dams, and other infrastructure that we need, we now need fiber, we need satellite, and a range of other digital infrastructures to ensure that the digital divide does not hamper the potential development outcomes. Very importantly, of course, is accelerated industrial development for Africa, our plan for Africa's industrialization. These all fit into our continental development strategy, Agenda 2063. And the AFCFDA has to find synergy with these other flagship projects. So let's look at some of the opportunities we have to leverage trade amongst ourselves, but also to change the paradigm for our trade with our global trade partners, to move away from the concentration of export of commodities to adding value to exporting more services to our global trade partners. And of course, in the process, attract foreign direct investment. I'd like to mention trade facilitation. This enjoys specific focus in the AFCFDA. And this is where we've seen many African countries already adopt digital trade solutions, e-certificates, e-payments during the pandemic of necessity. Ladies and gentlemen, this must be the, the way we do business going forward, not just a response to a crisis. The benefits of e-commerce, which will now be negotiated in the second phase of the AFCFDA, is particularly important. But we need to guard against some of the challenges which may be associated with e-commerce in terms of access for SMEs, the terms and conditions for getting access to platform opportunities, and so on. And that makes the third point I have here Conclusion, the issues project. that are to be negotiated in phase two, absolutely critical. Competition policy is so important that we do not erode the benefits of integration. Fundamentally, to conclude, Stephen, governance improvements that will come about as a result of the implementation of the AFCFDA provides an important impetus to attract investment to conduct trade, to make trade and investment contribute to our continent sustainable development. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Trudy. That was really a loaded presentation, almost covering the most topical issues that are related to, that can enable Africa uh, retool post COVID. I believe we have the Honorable Deputy Minister connected. So I have the pleasure and honor to invite him uh, to give us uh, uh, his uh, uh, perspective. Honorable Deputy Minister Robert Anonkalinze, you have the floor. Stephen, I think we may still be having some technical issues with the minister. I know that he can hear us loud and clear, but it, it appears that we can't hear him at this stage. Uh, this is our virtual reality uh, as we drive into this environment. Perhaps a call on one of your, your other panelists at this stage while we sure. try and ready the minister. Sure, Brian, thank you very much. I will now invite uh, my good old friend, Mr. Kenneth Bagamhunda, the Director General Customs Trade, uh, uh, Customs and Trade, East African Community, to give us his uh, perspective on the discussion at hand. Uh, thank you, Stephen, and uh, thank, I wish to thank the organizers of this uh, webinar for inviting us to participate in, the, in this discourse. In uh, looking at this aspect... Ah, of better. Receiving... Sorry. Ah. Sorry. Uh, Kenneth, I can I... Can I ask you to bear with oh, me? Okay, okay, okay. Let, yeah. let the minister go ahead. Okay, so minister, we now have you 
Uh, if you can uh, unmute, uh, we will be able to hear you, Minister, Deputy Minister, who is also a very good friend whom I haven't seen for more than 25 <laughs> years. Please go ahead and give us <laughs> perspective. Yeah. Yes, uh, good to see you. It's been very long. Sorry, I was sitting there fiddling with all my buttons to work out uh, how I could join you. I was I could hear everything you were saying, by the way. Yeah. For okay. some reason, I couldn't join you. Um, okay. Please bear with me. Let me uh, on, take the picture off so that the quality is better. Uh, yes. A real pleasure. Good to see you. It's been, I don't know how long. Um, anyway, More than 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Please Thank you ahead. again. And a pleasure to be with you here uh, this morning. Um, in fact, I am speaking to you from one of our regional capitals in um, a place, um, place called Ho in our Volta region. And we are here with our regional tour talking about how it is that the private sector in Ghana can be empowered to take full advantage of the continental free trade area. But um, I wanted just to give my few remarks on the topic, which is COVID-19 is a catalyst for accelerating trade and investment in Africa, even in the current environment. I think the reality, at least from Ghana's perspective, is one of the key lessons we have learned from the COVID is that we as a country have to ensure that we have policies and initiatives in place to encourage private sector investment, even both from foreign direct investment and increased domestic investment. Because the COVID-19 made it very clear to us uh, that we are in a situation where many of the value chains that we and others have, have relied upon has basically been challenged, if there's the best way I can put that. So we all relied on various value chains to do everything from PPEs to ensuring Ghana is a country that imports huge amounts of its food stuff. For instance, we import over $1.4 billion of rice from Thailand and other countries every year. And what it has done is that it's made us re realize it in a short, sharp way that we cannot rely on those value chains going forward and that we have to make some significant changes to encourage private sector investments to address some of those challenges we face. So for instance, within the PPE area, when the COVID-19 hit, we galvanized 14 of our uh, garments factories in Ghana, and they have now prepared all the PPEs and face masks for the country, where we have a capacity now to do 1 million um, PPEs every day. Um, from our own domestic manufacturing. We're in a situation where all the face masks have been done for all the schools by our, uh, our own garments factory. And by the way, in the, on, as, a, as part of that, we also created 10,000 direct jobs as a result of those areas. So what COVID has done is it is it's refocused our attention. It is refocused our attention also on the following, that truly, truly we must enact this old age and age that the private sector is the engine of growth. We must do everything we can to encourage them. So what are some of the activities we engaged in? Number one, we have, for instance, now embarked on setting up a development bank within Ghana already. $250 million of that has come from the World Bank. We have set up a guarantee scheme of 2 billion cities, roughly um, 2 billion cities from our central bank to our um, banks in Ghana to make sure they lend to the private sector. This has been one of the biggest challenges, providing term funding to them. It's been a great challenge. Government has refocused its attention on the industrial transformation, including one of our programs, which is called the One District, One Factory. We have 265 districts in our country. This will not be news to Japan or to South Korea or to even Thailand that I was recently, where I think it's one product, one tampon in, in that area where we have refocused our attention to add value in each one of our districts to create value chain based investments. We've also decided that because of this, and this is where the catalyst becomes clear, we have become very ambitious, if you will, in our objective of providing growth poles in our country. So one of them, for instance, is an automobile industry. In 2017, even before COVID, our president had driven a transformation, the Ghana Beyond Aid, some of you may have heard that, that terminology, an industrialized Ghana, and we focus on an automobile industry. Today, as we speak, seven, com seven companies, this is um, 
um, Volkswagen has already started assembling vehicles here. Uh, two days ago, Nissan started assembling. We have Toyota, we have um, Honda, uh, we have uh, um, Sino Truck. We have seven companies now starting to assemble vehicles in Ghana. Our focus there is the SMEs to be part of the value chain of these businesses. So what this has done, if I look at the, 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 the COVID, it is that we started on the journey that said we must industrialize because for 30 million people, an economy that is based on the export of raw materials and import of finished products does not create enough opportunities for our people. We need to change. What COVID has done is put even more fuel to that drive to ensure that we put in real government intervention. Yes, fiscal discipline, monetary predictability, those are key, but we are now becoming extremely proactive in backing our private sector, and I stress that, not governments building factories, that doesn't work, we're not gonna go that way, but backing our private sector to engage. So we believe that COVID has acted as an impetus, further fuel to our drive towards the transformation of Ghana, a Ghana beyond aid, as our president has stipulated. Let me leave it there as initial comments. I'm sure we can discuss a little later. Thank you oh, for the patience. Ex excellent. Uh, Robert is really honorable, honorable Deputy Minister. I mean, that was a very incisive and clear articulation showing that Ghana has already retooled and reset forced by the situation. So we will come back hopefully with some questions. Now I have the pleasure to invite and apologize to Kenneth again for the slight uh, change, but as uh, Brownwin was saying, the, the, the challenges of technology are still with us. We have, that's part of our retooling as we go along. Uh, we expect this happening all the time uh, because we used to concentrate on live conferences. So Kenneth, over to you. Uh, thank you, Stephen, and thanks once again to the organizers of this uh, webinar. Uh, when you are looking at this uh, issue of retooling, resetting, and restarting, and utilizing, and uh, harnessing the opportunities presented by the COVID-19 uh, in as far as implementation of the CFTA is concerned, it is critical to understand the impact of COVID-19 on the integration initiatives in Africa, and also to identify what has been slowed or reversed in the, in the, as far as uh, integration programs are concerned, and the lessons that we have uh, learned from the pandemic, and what opportunities has it presented that we can uh, ride on for purposes of uh, post-COVID uh, recovery in Africa. From the ESC's perspective, the essence of integration has become more and more fundamental with the COVID-19 pandemic. Because right from the outset, it was realized that the, the more you are unified, the more you are able to tackle some of the challenges that come with the pandemic. And uh, this was uh, based on the fact that when the countries were locking down, it was realized that this would affect trade and investment in the region. And uh, what therefore was critical was to keep the movement of goods uh, open or facilitated in a very joint manner, in a joint basis at the East African level. And I believe preserving the trade and investment during and after the COVID is very critical under the CFTA. And this comes along with the addressing the challenges that inhibit trade and investment. And I think when you look at the framework of the CFTA, there, there, is, there, there are specific aspects of uh, uh, integration that need to be handled from the continental perspective in order to have uh, 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 the objectives attained under the CFTA. So the integration becomes very critical as a, a driver 
for addressing issues that come along with the pandemic. Definitely, when you look at the impact, you find that there were quite a number of sectors that were really badly affected. And therefore, how do we revamp and recover some of these sectors like tourism, hospitality industry, air transport, education sector as a service, the financial sector, all these, of course, leading to uh, unemployment, uh, eroding the income levels, and of course, affecting the livelihood of our people. And in particular, also the small and medium enterprises. So we also noted the resilience or opportunities that in some sectors, for example, in food production and food distribution, the marketing, aspect, the digitalization, which becomes a very critical, I think Trude talked about it. How do we uh, harness the e-commerce as, as a means, as a driver of our trade and investment? And the repurposing of the production facilities, like what the minister has said that is taking place in Ghana, we, we've, we, we've seen uh, manufacturers repurposing their, their, their manufacturing lines to orient them to address the, the requirements, the essential requirements during the COVID, the production of PPEs, the production of sanitizers, and the production of other pharmaceutical products, which becomes a very a big priority that we should look at in the region. Now, another thing I think it has been touched on is the value chains the value chain development. I think the need for regional and continental value chains have come in very, very clearly that we need to have a lot of focus on in order to integrate our economic production sectors. And therefore, we across the continent, we need to see which value chains need to be developed and in this we need to interconnect our economies by having the right policies that the right investment climate and the right uh, enabling uh, uh, roles and uh, and uh, institutional framework that will support the, these value chains. And this particularly comes in on inclusiveness. How do we have the private sector play a key role at the continental level and at the regional level? I'm talking about the regional level because we should utilize and, and uh, leverage on the development so far made in some of the wrecks in as far as the integration is concerned in order to have a, 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 a CFTA that is anchored to the regional economic communities in terms of uh, driving the, the integration process. Uh, on the, one of the other aspects that the CFTA needs to seriously look at is the issue of non-tariff barriers. I know there are quite some programs in place at the regional level, even at the tri tripartite uh, free trade area level to programs for addressing NTBs. Now, given that one of the main impediments of trade and investment in the, in the continent is the NTBs, the continental free trade area needs to come out with specific programs. I know there is the, African Trade Observatory that has come in place. There is initiatives to have uh, interconnectivity of key agencies. There is trade portals which are being put in place. These, all these are initiatives that we should use for purposes of addressing the, use, utilizing the opportunities that have come up, that, that have come up with the pandemic. And we need also the strategic sectors. I think healthcare and education sectors and other social service sectors that were that had not been given due emphasis have 
come out, we have come to realize that it is the, those are the areas now of focus. Health, uh, of course, the pandemic came in and Africa healthcare system are a little bit weak. Now there is need to look to how we can incorporate the healthcare systems as part of the fundamental service in, in, in as far as trading services is concerned, but also as a social service sector that can be provided even across the, the borders. And the import substitution aspect for basic necessities that we need in the region, in the, in the, on the continent becomes very pertinent. Uh, and this could also be based on uh, specific interventions like putting in place uh, investment hubs, industrialization uh, strategies that at the continental level, of course, we have some already under the AU under the 2063, the IDA and uh, other programs, the, the, the BIAT. We need to look how we can enhance agro processing and have open trade across borders. In East Africa, what we one thing we noted is that by having some of the facilities in place for cross-border infrastructure like the OSBP became a very big asset in terms of uh, in a facilitating movement of goods. Had we still been with the old infrastructures at our borders, I think it would have been more chaotic. Even the delays, we were able to address them because of the infrastructure, cross-border infrastructure that we had in place. And I think the issue of joint efforts is very critical. The integration of Africa becomes a very fundamental driver of uh, addressing challenges that come with the pandemic. In ESC, as I finalize, we, we, we have developed what we call a post-COVID recovery program that looks at specific factors and interventions that need to be undertaken for purposes of getting the economies back on foot and we get back on the trajectory that we'll have so that once the pandemic is over, then the, the countries are able to get back to their uh, economic growth levels. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kenneth. That was an excellent um, uh, expose on the actual regional perspective. I am glad that you came in at that point after we had had the national perspective because, and you made a very important point, without the regional perspective and the regional integration that exists at the moment succeeding, we will not have the continental free trade area. And absolutely, because some of these uh, trials, some of these uh, elements for integration we are making an effort to achieve at CFTA have already been achieved. So last but not least, I will now ask uh, Mrs. Annabel Gonzalez, fellow at Peterson Institute for International Economics to give us her perspective. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Stephen, and uh, thanks so much uh, to the African Development Bank and the uh, Korea Customs Service uh, for inviting me to this uh, seminar. Uh, just a couple of months before the uh, pandemic, I was in Abidjan uh, talking about uh, many of these uh, issues. Uh, so I'm happy to be back uh, in, this, uh, in this virtual format. Um, so let me share my screen. I'm having difficulty sharing my screen. I wonder whether um, the organizers could help me with the presentation. Doha. Now I think now, okay. now I'm able to do it. Yes. Okay, good, good. good. Okay, perfect. I was granted permission. We so see it clear. Uh, yes, you see it there. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'd like to start uh, I'd like to start my presentation with this uh, quote, which I always find uh, very inspiring, which is that uh, from uh, President Paul Kagame, uh, the promise of free trade and free movement is prosperity for all Africans. Uh, and, and I do think that he's, uh, he's absolutely uh, right. So we know, and I won't um, stay here very long, that COVID-19 has deepened some pre-existing trade frictions in terms of the high level of import duties or non-tariff measures uh, or the cost of importing and uh, exporting. 
And most importantly, uh, COVID-19 has also highlighted, I would say at least six growth opportunities for the private sector. And a number of them have been uh, mentioned uh, before. So from leveraging innovations to drive regional value chains and foster structural transformation, we've, had, we've heard some uh, uh, wonderful stories from Ghana, uh, for example, or from Rwanda, but also we know that uh, there are great stories coming out from Kenya uh, or from Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire, for instance, on the test kits. And uh, this can certainly, I think, uh, very well provide the basis, uh, the basis to move to regional value chains, maybe in medical goods and pharmaceuticals, uh, maybe in some other uh, products as well, automobiles uh, and others for sure. The second opportunity is to protect and upgrade Africa's place in global value chains. We know that a number of countries in the region are uh, well connected to both global value chains, but global value chains have been impacted in the context of the pandemic. So there's a need to strengthen robustness and uh, resilience, um, but also there's an opportunity to attract investments uh, to serve uh, the regional uh, market. So a third opportunity, and I think it has been mentioned before, is to tap into the interregional food demand and facilitate uh, food trade across borders. And uh, I think this could help enhance agricultural product diversification towards more processed uh, goods. Fourth uh, opportunity is to leverage new prospects for health and uh, education uh, services. And uh, truly was mentioning uh, this uh, from, you know, improving healthcare from delivering medicines via drone to telehealth applications and a number of other opportunities as well. And also uh, to embrace the transition to virtual learning. And we know that there are infrastructure challenges, uh, but nevertheless, this is an opportunity uh, that, uh, that should be uh, uh, explored. Fifth opportunity is to turn the pandemic related boom in e-commerce into sustainable business models, uh, accelerating, for instance, the shift towards a more sustainable uh, food future, uh, leveraging digital technologies and increasing the offer of digital services and digitally enabled services. And last but not least, uh, the COVID-19 is an opportunity to enhance regional uh, resilience and prepare for a uh, future crisis. Now, uh, how do you move from, uh, uh, from promise to prosperity? And, uh, and I think this is a very important uh, question. So here I would like to uh, propose six actions for, the, uh, for leveraging the continental uh, free trade area to drive uh, trade and investment. So my first uh, action is, uh, or suggestion is to make it happen. That is, we prioritize and finalize phase one uh, negotiations. And uh, let me say three quick things here, uh, which is that in concluding the negotiation of tariff schedules, uh, it would be important to limit product exceptions and prioritize in particular for early liberalization, critical medical goods, given their importance in, uh, in uh, fighting the pandemic, uh, food staples, inputs and intermediate goods, which by the way, uh, should also probably uh, benefit from uh, the elimination of most favor nation tariffs um, in order to facilitate um, uh, participation in global value chains. And finally, prioritize also products that can provide a natural ladder for diversification. Now in finalizing the rules of origin, uh, again, the focus on simple and liberal rules of origin is important to reduce transaction cost. And here I find very interesting the example of the Regional and Comprehensive Economic Partnership uh, just signed a few days ago by 15 countries in the Asia uh, Pacific, ASEAN 10 plus uh, Japan, Japan, China, Korea, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. And they agreed basically on one common rule of origin with a unique certificate of origin to ship product between members. And estimates show uh, that this could reduce export costs by some 4% of uh, interest on merchandise trade, which is quite significant. And finally, in focusing on services, uh, it has been agreed already to reprioritize uh, sectors for negotiation to include health, uh, maybe education, uh, and providing for early liberalization and common regulatory frameworks in this area. And uh, also important uh, to uh, eliminate uh, FDI restrictions uh, in critical export related services, such as uh, processing, uh, transport, logistics, and of course in ICT services to support cross-border digital um, uh, services. So a second um, uh, uh, proposal for action 
is to make it work. And that basically means focusing on implementation. Uh, and this includes preparing implementation roadmaps to guide governments on regulatory, operational, and administrative requirements for full entry into practice. I have had the opportunity of negotiating a number of trade agreements uh, for, for my country of origin, Costa Rica, with the US, with Europe, with China, uh, with countries in the region. And implementation is always a very demanding uh, task. So these roadmaps, I think, are very critical to make sure that the uh, CFTA can operate in practice. Another important point, and I think Kenneth was making a, a great presentation on some of the progress in this area, which is reducing red tape and simplifying customs procedures. We know that the World Bank, but also the African Development Bank estimates, all of them uh, find out that um, streamlining customs and border uh, procedures is a very important component, component for um, leveraging the gains uh, from the CFTA. Some things like fast track the release of goods with non-intrusive inspection mechanisms or improving border coordination, standardizing trade, transit trade and others will be important. It was also uh, mentioned before the need to reduce non-tariff barriers and harmonize regulatory measures. And I would suggest to prioritize, for instance, trading critical medical goods and food products uh, given the importance uh, in the current context. And then quite uh, relevant as well, building specialized capacity in the trade related public sector institutions like the trade ministries, the customs agencies and others to foster alignment, effectiveness and interagency coordination. Second, uh, third, I'm sorry, uh, set of recommendations is to fast track priorities by accelerating and reorganizing next steps with a focus on high standards. Here, uh, it has been already agreed to accelerate the negotiations of phase two. I would like to highlight in particular the role of the um, uh, protocol on investment, which I think will be critical, and also um, speed up the negotiations on digital commerce. I would like to mention then in, then in parallel, and this could be very supportive of the negotiations, joining the negotiations in the WTO in this area uh, could also be uh, quite relevant. Fourth uh, area of recommendation is to accelerate impact, uh, leveraging domestic and foreign investment to build productive capacity, promote access to technology and spur structural transformation. And here I think it was again, Trudy who was mentioning the absolutely critical role of, uh, of investment, foreign direct investment and domestic as well, uh, for which it is important to continue improving the business environment strengthen national investment promotion agencies so that they can do their job in attracting investment and fostering linkages programs to connect domestic firms to multinationals uh, to begin to build um, uh, uh, clusters uh, around a number of these areas. Fifth important point is to bring many African countries to benefit. Uh, many Africans to benefit, uh, putting consumers, small traders and producers at the heart of the CFTA. And this would mean things like reducing bottlenecks that hinder trade along the food supply chain, uh, implementing simplified trade regimes for small scale uh, traders across borders uh, along the lines of some that are already in place in EAC and ICOMESA, broadly disseminating the opportunities and the benefits of the CFTA so that producers are aware of these opportunities, strengthening national export promotion agencies to provide support uh, to uh, potential exporters, creating capacity to meet regulatory safety and technical standards, and improving competition policy and institutions. And uh, last but not least, uh, it is important, and uh, we know that there are a number of programs in place to complement the CFTA with policies and investments to facilitate visa-free movement of business persons, improve the transport corridors and logistics, expand access to energy, in particular renewable energy, upgrading skills and competencies, fostering product and process innovation, and promoting vigorous competition uh, in, uh, in uh, key sectors. Um, so with this, let me stop here and uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to our discussions. Thank you very much, Annabel. Um, and I also reiterate my thanks to all the other speakers for keeping time, but above all for excellent presentations that really were complementary. Starting with Trudy, who gave a highlight of the vulnerabilities that have arisen as a result of COVID and the available tools that we can use to address and indicating that those tools are already there, uh, including the policies set out under, FCA, under the CFTA, but also the need to 
uh, retool them, such as focus on some key areas that have arisen, such as education and health, and also tying it in with the need to attract investments and highlighting the existing tools under the, under the AU, which she called the flagship projects, which are absolutely important for, for retooling as we go forward. Then we had the minister, Honorable Deputy Minister, giving us the national perspective. It was excellent to realize that even at the national perspective, at the national level, we already have policies and initiatives by, taken by some of the governments like Ghana. Uh, the issue of, uh, of addressing value chains uh, uh, has, has somehow arisen as a bigger important issue, especially in relation to health, health, uh, health material. Uh, the need to do import substitution in a situation where we have the, the COVID challenges. And then the need to uh, bolster our private sector by putting our money where our mouth is, he indicated the establishment of a development bank. So those are already those are already big tools. And I know many other countries that have uh, are, that have used the resources extended to them by the MDBs to bolster available funding for private sector. And then we had uh, Kenneth highlighting the tools that already exist and the experiences at regional level, uh, which was extremely useful to see that uh, the EAC, which is regarded as the most successful regional integration arrangement in, on the continent, already has tools in place and realized it earlier that the most important point was uh, during the, the COVID pandemic was to make sure that goods continued moving and the facilitation existed. And he went on to highlight some of the regional uh, projects already in place, including um, the challenge of addressing NTVs and uh, the need to enhance value chains across the whole region. Uh, something which the minister had also tapped on in terms of the national level with respect to some industries that they think could benefit. Finally, we had Annabelle give us, giving us a very clear uh, indication of what are the growth opportunities uh, uh, available to, to the continent. She highlighted, first of all, the, those areas we can leverage on. Some of them had already been highlighted, innovations, value chain, health and education, e-commerce, and so on. But then she also gave us ideas on moving to prosperity, highlighting what we need to do to complete the effectiveness of the CFT arrangements. With that now, can I invite uh, one or two questions before I conclude? Uh, Bronwyn, you want to come in there? I hand over to you. Stephen, uh, I think let's, let's take it to the, the next discussion, unless there are any burning questions, but I think you've done a, an amazing summation of all of the, the points that have been delivered by your respective panelists. And I think one of the, the key issues really driving home is the need for governments to create an enabling environment. You heard it repeated over and over again to make sure that we tra attract um, foreign direct investment into the African continent so that we can set up the appropriate infrastructure and, and really use that capital as a catalyst for trade. So I think we'll, we'll pick up with Q&A later in the session. Stephen, thank you very much uh, for that great moderation. We're now moving to the second part of our discussion, and that is, of course, reducing costs of doing business through trade facilitation and enhancing competitiveness and competition. Au webinar, réduire les coûts uh, des affaires. This is a crucial part of obviously what we're looking to uh, in terms of supporting the uh, Africa continental free trade area. And uh, just picking up on a point that Trudy made is that the Africa continental free trade area is to be implemented now, 1st of January. 2021. So our moderator is Dr. Stephen Karingi. He's Director, Regional Integration and Trade Division, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. We joined also by Sydney Chibabuka, Commissioner for Customs and Excise, the Zambia Revenue Authority, and Sanyong Park, Assistant Director in Information Planning Division, Korean uh, Customs Service. So, uh, Stephen, I'm going to hand over to you at this point. Fantastic that we're getting Zambia in as a voice, obviously having heard from Ghana as the representative of West Africa earlier, and then, of course, the commissioner 
representing the East Africa community. Stephen, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Bronwyn. Um, I don't have power, but I hope you all can see me and hear me clearly. And um, if I disappear, uh, hopefully I'll be able to rejoin you. So let me thank everyone for joining us uh, in this um, sessions. I think we had a very good uh, panel uh, that has just ended. Quite very good uh, insights were given uh, to us. So what I'm going to do before I pass on the floor to my two panelists, I'm going to show you three slides and what these three slides are going just to add some incremental information to what we had from um, the, first, uh, the first panel. Let's uh, look at, we heard about what has happened to the African trade. Now, what I would want you to focus on here is the fact that intra-African exports, even though they have fallen. They have not fallen by as much as African exports to the rest of the world has fallen. Now, these statistics from our sister agency, Antad, basically reinforce the message that we had from the first panel and also uh, from, our, from, our, from, our, from our, our, our keynote speak, speech that there is something in intra-African uh, trade that we need to harness by taking advantage of the innovations that we have seen under COVID-19 as we prepare to implement the AFCFTA. Now, of course, the second point, we all know that while we are discussing in this panel, the balancing act that African government have had to do to minimize COVID-19 spread and also maintain the openness of the borders. But that is not what I want to, to emphasize in my introductory part, is just to add three other regional dimensions to what we had of what is happening in the East African community. So essentially in this last final slide that I have before you, you will see the mission, what um, the different regional economic communities have been trying to do in terms of ensuring that trade continues within their subregions. Now, and then the big question then becomes, how do you harness these different guidelines so that you come up with continental guidelines that make the AFCFTA operate uh, seamlessly. And most importantly, of those innovations that have happened maybe in ECOWAS or in EAC or in COMESA or in SADAC, how do we lock them in? Because the, the innovations have come up because of the pandemic, yet we know we have had long-standing challenges with trade facilitation. So, so with this um, uh, introductory remarks as your uh, moderator, I'm going now to call upon um, Sydney, who is from um, Zambia. And what I'm going to ask Sydney to do is, I know you may have had a message you wanted to pass to us, which I will allow you to do that. But even as you do that, I would want you to tell us how is Zambia preparing to recover from COVID-19 through the ASCFTA? And what exactly is your service doing as a customs um, official or, or leader? What exactly are you, do, are you doing to make this happen? So Sydney, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Uh, I want to thank the organizers, um, the African Development Bank, Korea Customs, uh, Dr. Karingi, and all the other participants uh, that have joined us for this forum. 
Uh, it is an interesting topic uh, where we are, of course, looking at uh, turning a crisis into an opportunity. Without a doubt, uh, the outbreak of COVID-19 negatively affected trade and travel globally, and uh, Zambia was not spared. Uh, we had to immediately develop measures to curb uh, cross-border spread of the disease, while at the same time facilitating trade by ensuring the flow of essential supplies, mainly food, medicines, fuels, and all other essential goods. As Zambia Revenue Authority and as a country, we made a deliberate effort to ensure that uh, we were actively involved in activities under the SADC National Technical Committee on Health to ensure that there was continued flow of trade. As a committee and working with other committees within the region, we drafted and implemented guidelines on harmonization and facilitation of cross-border trade and transport during the COVID-19 pandemic. As Zambia Revenue Authority, we also developed our own measures to ensure that we continued being relevant to our community. Some of the highlights include the following. We already had pre-registration of, um, of um, entries uh, at our borders, uh, but during the pandemic, uh, we ensured that we made uh, pre-arrival registration pre-arrival declaration of goods at the borders mandatory. Importers or exporters of commercial goods were then during this period required to submit a declaration to customs through our Scuda World platform prior to the arrival of these goods at the border. And the thinking here was that uh, we wanted to minimize interaction at our borders. And therefore, if you pre-register then we'll start working on your declarations, your submissions ahead of arrival of the goods at the borders so that we spend as little time as possible with these goods and there's no need for you to remain at the borders for a long time. We also, during this time, ensured that uh, we enhanced the requirement for pre-clearance. This is a system where customs declarations are lodged duties and taxes are assessed and payments are made prior to the arrival of goods at the border. Release formalities would then be done once the goods arrive at the border because we would have fulfilled all the requirements ahead of the goods arriving at the border. While this is still optional at the moment, uh, we are riding on the fact that uh, pre-registration is mandatory. We also, during this period, ensured that we introduced what we call export release uh, from inland stations. And therefore, mining companies, manufacturers, uh, producers of agricultural products did not have to send all the consignments to the borders. Instead, we encouraged them to use our inland offices all over the country. Again, this was in an effort to ensure that we decongest our borders while at the same time ensuring that there was continued flow of trade. We also emphasized that uh, we would not be accepting cash at uh, our borders and offices, and therefore electronic real-time payment of assessed duties and taxes uh, was made possible through all the 16 commercial banks in the country. Currently, 98% of customs duties and taxes are paid by e-payment compared to 85% before the pandemic. Again, we achieved a lot of uh, uh, time uh, in that people didn't have to physically travel to the banks or carry cash to, to the borders. And therefore, this mode of uh, payment proved to be very secure and convenient for all taxpayers. Again, for the small cross-border traders, uh, though at this time we saw a reduction in uh, passenger travel, we still, um, through an integrated cashiering initiative, encouraged payment of import taxes at any office 
countrywide without necessarily going to the office where the goods are. And therefore, taxpayers, again, did not need to travel to specific borders of importation of goods to make a payment. Again, this was uh, in observance of the COVID-19 health protocols, therefore saving time and costs for traders. I also included in my presentation some uh, specific measures that we made at uh, selected border crossings. Uh, for instance, at Chirundu, uh, which is one of our biggest border crossings linking us to Zimbabwe and South Africa. Uh, before the pandemic, we used to operate from 06 to 10, but now this border operates 24 seven. We also started um, undertaking daily monitoring of movement of traffic through analysis of statistics of cleared and cleared consignments so that we could allocate resources at borders uh, to deal with uh, goods as they arrive. Also working with uh, cities and infrastructure for growth, uh, Zambia established a COVID-19 Chirundu Interagency Technical Coordination Committee to enhance border coordination at Chirundu. CIG Zambia also assisted in promoting trade facilitation measures of pre-registration, pre-clearance and ele electronic payments of taxes. At Kasumbalesa, which is another border crossing with uh, DRC uh, to the north of Zambia, we again adjusted operating hours from 06, um, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And now we are operating from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. daily. And this measure increased traffic flow at our border. We also established fast lanes for trucks carrying essential goods like fuels, uh, personal protective equipment, medicines, and food supplies. We also prioritize clearance and release of transit goods, especially of an essential nature for all our neighboring countries. We also established an interdepartmental task force that included the police, um, the road transport and safety agency, Zambia Revenue Authority, just to ensure that there was seamless flow of traffic across the borders. We also undertook to exempt um, some trucks that had been delayed at the border from paying border crossing fees. If you know this place very well, you know that this is one of the border crossings where we have a concessionaire managing the border crossing. So what are some of the benefits? We noticed that through these measures, we reduced the cost of doing business, at the same time reducing the cost, I mean, the spread of COVID-19. What were some of the lessons? We sincerely noticed and appreciated that e-commerce has now become important during COVID-19. We also learned that strong coordination and collaboration of key stakeholders is key in facilitating quick and safe trade. And like Albert Einstein said, in the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. And these measures that we implemented during COVID-19 pandemic, although we still have it, but at the height of this pandemic, these measures have now been adopted as permanent. I thank you. Thank you so much, Sydney. Uh, in fact, uh, you have answered my question what exactly uh, Zambia has been doing and um, how this would help in the FCMTA by locking in what you have found to be uh, you know, innovative. Uh, let me uh, pass the floor now to uh, the Korea customs and, and this is uh, uh, Sang Yong. Um, Sang Yong, is there anything different you had to do or you were ready when COVID-19 happened? In other words, are there reforms and measures that you had taken as South Korea that put you in a better position to deal with the impact of COVID-19? And are there things that you have found that you needed to do and you have done them that you can share with us as lessons. You have the floor. Thank you.
Stephen, I think while we are waiting for Sun Yong to come on, there are a couple of questions that perhaps we can uh, throw um, into the discussion from the floor. Uh, the first one being from Armand in Bandama uh, from the Ivory Coast, who, who actually is asking for exactly what we are uncovering on this webinar, and that is examples of what has been done by different countries to catalyze their growth or to leverage off COVID-19 for the positive. So that is certainly one of the examples we saw coming through from Zambia um, just a moment ago, and then also from Ghana earlier in the discussion, and also from the East African community. Uh, the other question coming through is um, with regards to the infrastructure development and whether infrastructure development is in fact um, enough or conducive to free trade across the African continent. So perhaps we can just bring those into the discussion as well as we wait for, for Sun Yang to, to take the floor. Do you have any thoughts on either of those issues? I mean, perhaps we just start with the infrastructure aspect where we see that uh, what that infrastructure deficit is still between 90 to $95 billion on an annual basis. We're far from ready on an infrastructure perspective, which is why we need the FDI, correct? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, Bronwyn, that's that's fine. We can come back to those, but I see uh, Mr. Park is ready now. He has uh, unmuted, so I think we should um, give him the opportunity to to come in now. Brilliant. Thank you, Mr. Park. Yes. <clears throat> yes. For uh, uh, well, the, for the for the past fifty years, uh, well, we have been. Um, um, developing the the Eclean system, uh, which was uh, used uh, to uh, now the, uh, the uh, now now the used of used for the measures uh, to the COVID nineteen situation. Uh, now uh, now the contactless uh, well, administration is very important. So uh, well uh, well we. My presentation today, I would I would like to uh, well uh, introduce uh, the eclean system, which is used uh, very importantly nowadays, uh, used to uh, well uh, prepare for the uh, the post COVID nineteen situation. So uh, well, the uh, I think the the uh, answers uh, my answers uh, are uh, well contained uh, in my presentation. Uh, what I I would like to uh, make. Uh, today. Yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah. Do you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, as, as introduced, I am Sang Yong Park from the Korea Customs Service. Uh, I'm honored to present today from before all the participants from governments and international organizations and private uh, institutions. Uh, well, I will present about the, how Korea's e-clearance e system contributed to Korea's trade concentrating on the process of creating a 100% digital document environment, contactless. Uh, in the first part, I will explain about the Korea's eclearance system in Unipass. Unipass is an overall information system related to customs and clearance, which was established and has been in operation by the KCS with a purpose of effective customs operations. Uh, year, uh, year 2020 marks the fifth uh, anniversary of KCS. Uh, from 1972 to date, uh, 1974 to date, uh, Unipass had four great leaps in its development with digitization in 1974 uh, to produce trade statistics, the history of the e-clearance system of the KCS began. Uh, between 1994 and 2003, 
there was a great stride with the introduction of the electronic data interchange method. From 2004, Unipass was switched over to the uh, internet-based open system and now preparing for $2 trillion trade era. The KCS successfully completed the fourth generation of Unipass to upgrade the entire e-clearance system in April 2016. Uh, as of 2019, the KCS through Unipass processed, processed 13 million export declarations and 5.6 million import declarations. Uh, as for customs duties and internal taxes, approx approximately 59 trillion won, which is around 51 billion US dollars was collected. Uh, this accounts for approximately 20% of the total tax revenues in Korea. Additionally, FTA-related procedures, custom border surveillance, and crackdown on illegal activities are also carried out with uh, Unipass. Now, let's take a look at the effects of Unipass. The blue line shows the scale of the Korea's trade volume. And uh, as you notice, for about 20 years since 1990, uh, it increased about eightfold and the number of travelers uh, increased about 11 fold and the import and export declaration about five fold. In contrast, as you see the red line in the graph, uh, the number of customs personnel uh, during the past 20, 20 years since 1990 only increased by 16%. In order to effectively process the heavier workload due to the increasing value, trade volume and the number of travelers with the limited number of custom personnel, it was inevitable to upgrade the e-clearance system. This slide is also about the effects of Unipass. Unipass has been creating an annual total of 6.4 trillion won, which is $5.6 billion of economic effects. Out of 6.4 trillion won, uh, which is $5.6 billion, the direct effects from efficiency in reduced process time, uh, openness through the single window system and the re reduced document storage cost were 1.82 trillion won, which is uh, 1.6 billion US dollars. And the effects from the perspective of business uh, indicated to be 4.6 trillion won, which is $4 billion, uh, due to increased performance uh, in the business process. By introducing Unipass, the KCS significantly reduced the import clearance time and it is at the fastest level in the world. As indicated in the slide, uh, when operating the second generation, Unipass, the import clearance time was 9.6 days, but now with the fourth generation Unipass, it is reduced to 1.5 days. Fast clearance and cargo processing of the KCS is recognized as the best practices all around the world. The KCS is actively working with many countries worldwide, including American African countries for their custom to modernization, modernization modeling at the Unipass. As you see in the slide, the KCS has been cooperating with African countries since 2011, starting with Tanzania and then Cameroon, Ghana, and Algeria, and their eclipse establishments uh, based on Unipass. Additionally, we worked with Ethiopia for their single window system establishment. In addition to these five countries, the KCS worked together with Sudan, Nigeria, Tunisia, and Gabon, to diagnose their current customs procedure, procedures and to draw up future models in our customs modernization consulting project. We believe these uh, cooperative, cooperative work efforts will strengthen the relations between Korea and African countries and contribute to promoting bilateral trade. So far, uh, I explained about the background and effects of Korea's nuclear system, Unipass. Now, I will talk about how Korea was able to develop such an effective e-clear system. We will focus on creating the paperless clearance environment. 
1974, in order to produce the trade statistics, well, which used to be done by the Ministry of Finance, uh, the custom system began. In 1980, with the online method of statistics compilation, there was no more need for moving physical declarations. Building on the success uh, in digitization of, of trade statistics, robust research and development for digitization of customs procedures was conducted in the 18, 1980s. However, this was a closed, uh, closed uh, internal custom system disconnected from any outside systems and declarants had to visit the customs with documents. In 1992, with advanced telecommunication technologies, the file transfer system was developed and enabled declarants to send the documents to the customs in their offices without having to visit the customs in person. But the procedures were still carried out based on paper documents. In 1995, the EDI clearance system was established, which enabled paperless clearance. The early stage of EDI paperless clearance was limited. In 1998, the EDI method was expanded to import export cargo by connecting the declarations with cargo management. This completed the EDI paperless clearance system for import and export clearance. In 2001. Uh, Mr. Park, I was going to say that uh, maybe you can uh, hurry up, but I'm interested to hear how you're using the blockchain technology. So you have two minutes so that people can ask questions like I have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, well, the, uh, I, I'll continue <laughs> this, this slide. We, we, want, we want to ask questions. We want to ask questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so please uh, wrap up in two minutes so that we can have an opportunity to ask questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll skip. I'll skip this slide. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, we uh, we have improved the uh, regimes uh, of the clearance system, and also uh, we have um, we have changed the the regulations about the clearance, and uh, uh, well, which which is about the. Uh, the uh, uh, legal authority of the um, uh, uh, well, ele electronic documents. And also uh, we, uh, we opened the data uh, you know, to the public. Uh, well, we have 42 types uh, of trade related statistics uh, available uh, on the uh, internet and 40 types uh, available via open API. And also, uh, uh, well, uh, we have a national single window, uh, which is uh, um, which uh, uh, enables us to um, uh, enables traders uh, to just uh, by just one uh, declaration uh, they can uh, proceed to uh, the 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 uh, processes uh, of uh, custom processes and other regulatory agencies. And also we are expanding, ex expanding uh, the, the uh, well, single windows uh, uh, with, the, with other countries. Uh, uh, this is co called a global single window, uh, which is the uh, exchange of information uh, country of origin. Uh, we, we are now adopting uh, this uh, uh, global single window system uh, in, the, in the field of uh, exchanging the, uh, the certificates origins. And uh, we are now uh, uh, have, uh, um, uh, uh, well, exchanging uh, we have the certificates origin to, uh, with two countries and now uh, under the negotiation with two other countries. Yeah, and the crucial center role uh, in connecting the global economy for economic growth goes to the customs uh, as the border uh, management agency. 
Uh, Unipass is an e-clearance system which processes import and export declarations, including supporting documents entirely electronically. Uh, consequently, it enables fast and transparent clearance and also prevents at source uh, any intervention and corruption uh, through a thorough post-clearance uh, control based on accumulated data. Improvement of the e-clearance system can contribute to the uh, virtuous economic cycle uh, of trade facilitation and robust economic activities in the private sector, which leads to uh, increased fiscal revenues and more active investments in SOC. Uh, Korea, as one of the poorest countries in the 1950s, now stands at the world's 10th largest trader. And this was possible with various effort, efforts, among which was the uh, decisive investments in Korea's e-clearance system, uh, Unipass. Mr. Park, no, I, I, ah, that's your last thank slide. You. No. Thank you, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's too long. No, 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 <laughs> incidentally, your, your presentation was very good. So uh, I take it that from your presentation, you have answered my first question that you are ready for COVID-19 because you are already paperless. I think that answers the first part um, of, uh, of the question that I had uh, asked. Um, and I now want to, first of all, open the floor for anyone who has uh, some question. I see that Martin Asenia has raised their hand. How are we going to handle this runway? Because there's some people who have raised their hands. Ahmad Damana has also raised their hands. Are they able to ask their questions? So uh, from a technical perspective, um, let's see if we can go. Let's go to your first uh, raised hand and yes. see if it's possible. Mm -hmm. If not, we have got the chat uh, mechanism. So I would ask both those gentlemen to defer to, to chat. But let's see if we can try that first, uh, Stephen. Yeah, so can we give the floor to Martin? Martin Asenia, he or she, yeah, had raised his hand. IT support, are we able to get him to speak? Yes. We Martin, you have the floor to ask your question. Stephen? Yes? I think we Hello? might have to... Yeah, yeah, Martin is asking the question. Hello? Yeah, okay, continue. J'espère qu'on m'entend. J'essaie de me faire voir et de me faire entendre également. Je suis très content de participer à, à ces échanges autour de, de comment transformer cette, cette situation difficile du futur du Covid-19. Comment essayer de permettre que ça devienne une opportunité ou des opportunités pour nous en tant que jeunes Africains. Je suis avec des gens qui écoutent également avec moi. Alors, notre euh, question est simple. On vient de suivre euh, les douanes euh, zambiennes avec M. Sidney, également les douanes sud-coréennes avec euh, M. Pat. Alors, nous, on se dit, avec cette situation, il y a eu tellement de choses euh, en Afrique. Je suis en Côte d'Ivoire pour vous rappeler. Alors, il y a eu tellement de... C'est vrai, les gens parlent de, de douanes. Et au niveau de l'agriculture, par exemple... Euh, Il y a eu des denrées qui ont, qui ont péri parce que les gens étaient en confinement et tout ça. Et après, les agriculteurs, nous sommes, on se demande comment on fait pour relever la tête, pour essayer de, de remobiliser, de nous remobiliser pour le développement agricole. On a eu tellement, on a connu tellement de situations, on a connu tellement okay. de problèmes. À un moment donné, on ne pouvait pas aller dans les champs. À un autre moment, nos denrées ont... On pas pu les Thank you, Martin. On devait rester à la maison. Donc, voilà un peu nos, euh, comment nous on fait maintenant. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. I think the question um, that you are asking, we can pass it also to Sydney. You are asking a specific question on how the farmers can actually be helped during this period um, because they cannot go to, to their farms and they also they cannot go to the, to the markets. Thank you. Uh, a second question, we'll come back to you, Sydney and Mr. Park. The second, 
the second chance is given to uh, Badama Ahmad. Badama is no longer with us. Um, Samuel Sebo. In one minute. Samuel, you are muted. In one minute. Okay, this is not working. Um, yeah, so I think, so, yeah. Stephen, I, I think let's get Sydney to answer that question. I also, directly after that, I, I want Annabelle, I see she's very vigilant on our chat session, but there's a very important question that has been asked by Lamech Jastin. And I think once Sydney has answered the question you just put to him, uh, read the farmers, we'll get Annabelle to come in and answer Lamech Just Lame Justin's question. We'll put both uh, that question to Annabelle, if that works for you. Yeah, that's fine, that's fine. So let's go to Sydney and then we'll come back to Annabelle. Sydney, how are you dealing with your farmers? Thank you very much for that question. I hope I got it right. The line was uh, breaking. Uh, but to contextualize uh, the issue that um, our colleague has raised, uh, in as far as customs is concerned, we are trying to help farmers, for instance, by uh, uh, linking our customs system with uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, where we have uh, introduced uh, e-permits uh, on a single window platform. And uh, again, using a paperless environment, um, e-payments, the farmers can still transact uh, across borders using these platforms. Thank you. So let me come in here with the question from Lamech Justin. Uh, this was to Annabelle. Uh, he was saying, thank you very much, Annabelle, for an enriching presentation. Regarding your suggested action, your suggested action to make it happen by focus on implementation, it seems that some countries are still hesitant and hence make it difficult for the AFCFTA to become fully operational. And one such country, uh, uh, sorry, uh, becoming fully operational, and one of the reasons is the fear of tax revenue loss. Now, how can such countries be made to underplay the tax revenue loss factor and rather focus on the long-term gain of AFCFTA? And added to this is the complex rules of origin that are difficult to comply with due to low production capacity in our region. How can this issue be addressed to facilitate your suggested action to point two? Annabelle, can we get you to come in here? I know that you have answered uh, in the chat box, but it's a key question for our audience today. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Bronwyn. And of course, uh, thank you for uh, to Lamec for posing uh, these two very important questions. So on the first point, um, it is it is of course a concern, uh, you know, to a number of countries to, so as to what would be uh, the impact of eliminating tariffs within African trade uh, on uh, revenues. And here, the starting point is of course to assess what is the size of the problem? And uh, I want to quote here a recent World Bank study uh, that finds that the CFTA's uh, short-term impact on tax revenue is small for most countries. Uh, tariff revenues would decline less than 1.5% uh, for most countries. For most countries. Uh, there are a few exceptions, such as the Democratic Republic of Congo, for which they, uh, for which it, they would decline 3.4%, or the Gambia, or the Republic of Congo, or uh, Zambia. Um, but total tax revenues would seldom decline by more than 0.3% with a couple of exceptions um, for Djibouti, Republic of Congo, uh, the Gambia, and again, the DRC. Now, the reason why uh, uh, tax revenues uh, would be uh, relatively you know, small impacted is because imports from African countries account for a small share of tariff revenues for most countries. Uh, we know on the one hand that intra-African trade is relatively small and that when it happens, it happens mostly within the existing regional communities, which are already uh, duty, which, you know, where trade is already duty-free. 
But also it's important to mention that tariff revenues can be shielded from liberalization uh, in the exclusion, by including the products in the exclusion uh, list. Now, more importantly, I think, and this has been the experience of many parts of the world, in the medium term, as trade goes up, Tariff revenues also go up because you know um, products have to pay sales taxes and others. Uh, so it's also positive from the perspective of, uh, of uh, tariff, increasing tariff revenues. Now, on the second point uh, that Lab uh, mentioned, I think it's very important to emphasize the the need for the CFTA to focus on simple and non-stringent rules of origin for the competitiveness of the region in participating in both regional and global value chains, rules of origin should facilitate access to competitive inputs and intermediaries. Having very stringent rules of origin would only not only impact the competitiveness and uh, the, the uh, possibility of African firms to join regional and global value chains, but more importantly, instead of reducing trade costs, uh, they will tend to increase trade costs. And this should not be, this should be, you know, this would be counter uh, to all of the efforts that are being done uh, in the context of, uh, of the CFTA. Okay, okay, so so first of all, uh, thank you, thank you, Annabelle. It's nice to see you and it was nice to listen to you. Just to, to add on your last point that as of um, today, 81% um, of the tariff lines on the rules of origin have been agreed. Uh, covering 82% of the intra-African exports. Um, the, the, the senior officials are meeting as we are meeting now and the ministers will be meeting tomorrow to see whether they can raise uh, the number of uh, tariff lines under the uh, AFCFTA rules of origin. The point you raised, uh, Annabelle, uh, is, uh, is good about the simplicity, but um, we know the, the options of what has been agreed as we speak now and the outstanding areas of textiles, uh, chemicals, uh, automotive uh, industry. I think um, that's where this question of um, complexity is also, is also, is also being uh, discussed. But yes, it's true. Uh, it's an important issue and some good progress is being made in terms of what, um, in terms of making us ready for the 1st of January, 2021. Now, having said that, um, I'm trying to see Mr. Ahmad is back. Uh, can Ahmad uh, be given the floor to ask his question? And how many more minutes do we have, Bruno, for this session? I can't hear you. We've got uh, 15 minutes left, uh, so we can keep okay. it open to the floor. And then there's a question coming through for you as well, Stephen. So I'm going to put that to you I'll, after. Gone with Ahmed. Sure. Sure, Ahmed, you have the floor. If you can't, Ahmed, we'll give the floor to Nkapu. Nkapu? Okay, you are muted, but uh, you can unmute Nkapu and take the floor. Hello. Hello. Yeah, we can we can hear you. We can hear you. Continue. Okay. My name is Nkafu Kingsley. I'm the procurement officer for Watermine Investment Holdings from Cameroon. Uh, I wish to find out what are the prospects for the fast-moving consumer goods in a sector in this, for Africa because we noted that the, the COVID has not really affected the African continent that much, and they, we are we seem to be moving out of the crisis, and we expect that by the first semester of 2021. We will surely be popping out of the crisis. Are they, what are the prospects for, for transformational projects that uh, has to do with transforming raw materials in the fast moving consumers good industry? Thank you. Thank you, Kapu. Uh, who is going to take this question? Uh, are we able to, to, I mean, my panelist, uh, Mr. Park, whom I can't see on the floor anymore. Um, no, yeah, uh, and Sydney. So Sydney, if you want to take this question about, uh, based on the statistics of what is coming through Zambia uh, customs, what are the prospects for the fast moving consumer, consumer goods? Have you seen any impact uh, on that um, 
both internally and also through the one-stop order posts that you gave us as an example, because you, you do receive that uh, data digitally. Sydney, thank you. Uh, doctor, unfortunately, the line is uh, very bad. So I couldn't get that question. Um, if you can put uh, the, the the person asking can put the question on uh, the chat, then uh, I can respond. Um, or you can yeah. repeat the question. I yeah. I missed half of it. Okay. So what he and Kapu is saying is that um, COVID is coming to an end, and it's good to have that um, realistic uh, expectation. And so he was asking, what are the uh, prospects of fast moving consumer goods? So I suspect Cap is working in that sector. And so what I wanted you to tell us is based on the data from uh, Zambia Customs, what have you seen in terms of uh, trade on these fast moving goods? Uh, and what do you expect moving forward? He's asking about the prospects. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Of course, what we saw uh, during the at the height of the pandemic was that um, income levels, um, especially uh, disposable incomes for most households, went down. Uh, we also noticed that uh, certain companies, were manufacturers, were struggling, uh, even for companies that manufacture fast uh, consumer goods, because of. Uh, uh, funding constraints at uh, households and uh, institutional levels. Uh, what we saw was that uh, the demand for essential goods remained constant, if not heightened. Uh, you will be surprised, one of um, the interesting statistics that I saw uh, during the pandemic was that uh, our collections on uh, excise duty uh, went up. We had more beer sales uh, during the pandemic uh, than before. And uh, what this told us was that, I mean, because pubs and, um, and bars were closed during the pandemic uh, in respect of um, the protocols on health, uh, we saw a lot of consumers buying from supermarkets and drinking from home. So again, it, on that front, certain products, depending on uh, uh, the, 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 the habits, um, that took effect during the pandemic uh, still had a market, although essentially it was more of essential goods um, that remained uh, more marketable and in demand than uh, the other fast uh, moving goods. Thank you. And what is the next question, Bronwyn, to me? Uh, Sydney, this is from Rajan Desai. And I think it is applicable for everybody on this platform today because he is specifically saying that he wants to set up a company in East African countries. Um, and he, he's trying to get an understanding of which countries are allowing setup companies to happen now, i.e. opening up bank accounts without actually visiting the country because of the pandemic situation and travel being made impossible. So I think that is part of a bigger um, issue, Sydney, that we can perhaps respond to, and especially given your um, designation um, from a legal perspective, from an, from an Africa legal support facility perspective, how can you open a country without, I mean, a bank account or open a company without visiting the country? Uh, have you directed that to me? I think it's uh, for yeah. you, Stephen. It's for you, uh, Stephen. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, um, and unfortunately, thank you very much. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, most of the laws have changed in relation to opening bank accounts because of the uh, new restrictions uh, which come out of uh, the International Bank for Settlements. So the new restrictions relate to prevention of money laundering. Uh, I don't think there is any country in Africa now where you can open a bank account if you are not if you are not resident there, or if you do not establish residence in some form of legality like, uh, like um, an invest, obtaining an investment license. So if you obtain an investment license, that should be relatively easy because they, they facilitate for you. 
that if you don't have an investment license, which you can now get online in the majority of the countries, then the investment agencies can facilitate for you to get, uh, to get a bank account. But just as an individual, that is unlikely. Most of the countries have signed on to the relevant international money laundering uh, laws, which are now more restrictive in terms of opening bank accounts as a measure for preventing money laundering. So I can see the only avenue is establishing residence, either as a person or as a company, or through the investment uh, licensing systems. I hope that helps. Yeah. So, so Steve, thank you very much. But this then brings the big question of why we are here. Uh, we are talking about trade facilitation. We heard how Korea has taken advantage of digital system or e-commerce. Now, so how do we make e-commerce happen with payments taking place if we have to be there physically for us to operate bank accounts? So, uh, and I think this is a question to you, Stevie. Now that you, okay. now that I have, that, that I have you, do you have no, something no. to say about that in the context no. of e-commerce? No, yeah. you know, no. Thank you very much, uh, actually, for bringing that angle. I, I should have touched on it. You can still transact in majority of African countries uh, with uh, with uh, with electronic transactions without being present in the country because most of the countries, um, is, uh, they accept, I mean, Forex, and in terms of uh, Forex instruments, uh, the usual kind of instruments, even credit cards, also, so you can still transact for letters of credit. The facilitation for that now is available. Some of the countries, East Africa and Comesa have even gone further. They have a regional payment settlement scheme, so it's even easier. So you don't really need to be present. Uh, but I, I had only answered from one perspective, uh, which was kind of, sometimes you have translation issues, which was kind of related to opening an account. But in terms of the facilitation of trade, Africa has moved away from what it would have been uh, 15 years ago. So in fact, you can use your credit card. Uh, one of the biggest uh, fast spreading e-commerce company, Jumia, is using credit cards and uh, mobile money where it is. And the, most of the countries have introduced mobile money. So you can actually pay with mobile money. There are a lot of platforms which have been introduced. So you can pay through, you can pay through your bank in London or in uh, Paris uh, through one of those platforms and somebody receives the payment on mobile money. But those are small transactions. For larger transactions, you can also do, do that electronically and vice versa. I hope that helps. No, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, I think the last um, uh, footnote I would add to that is that on the first question where he asked, um, you have to be there physically. This basically demonstrates to us why digital identities are very critical. And I think um, those of us who are familiar with this issue of legal identity know that um, more than half of Africans do not actually have a legal identity, so to speak. So if we can actually harness the digital identities and the potential that they have, then you don't have to cross borders to open bank accounts because of the interoperability of the systems, if we make that happen. Of course, are protected under the digital laws that uh, Trudy alluded to in the kind of uh, digital framework that Africa should, 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 should operate in. So I think we still have um, three minutes and I would want to give the floor to Ahmad if you can make it this time. Otherwise, you can lower your head and then move to conclusion. Okay, Evelyn, it's good to... Oh, okay, Ahmad, Ahmad, you can take the floor. Ahmad, thanks. Morning, everybody. I'm very happy to follow you. I'm Arman from Ivory Coast, internal auditor in banking area. I would like to know uh, in this in your strategy, if you take uh, you takes uh, you take in account the informal sector. I mean the people living in the village, people living in the village. For example, in Ivory Coast, about fifty percent of the population live in village, and they they are they are not. 
they don't have access to bank, they don't have access to to, to credit, something like that. Because when the when the deputy ministry of uh, agriculture of Ghana was speaking, he said that uh, the government uh, uh, guarantee the loan that the bank should uh, should give to the to the SME to the small business, something like that. But how? Thank you. Uh, no, no, it, your question is clear. Your question is clear, Ahmed. And we'll give yeah. the question to Sydney. Uh, Sydney, how have you dealt with the Como sector? Uh, Sydney, did you get the question? How have we dealt with the informal sector with regards to what? Um, is it um, cross border trade? I During guess, the pandemic? Uh, yeah, I think it includes that, yes. And I think you touched on it in your presentation, but maybe you can come in again. Yes, um, yes, Doctor. Um, this is one of uh, the areas that uh, suffered adversely during the pandemic. And um, the reason is that uh, for most of our borders, um, cross border passenger travel. Uh, was banned and is still largely banned except for a few airlines that have started coming into the country and uh, this is uh, again this was done mainly due to um, health protocols that were implemented and we still continue to observe uh, now um, what we saw again is that for a few uh, probably they had to change their mode of uh, business um, by maybe putting their funds together and uh, uh, order their consignments from um, abroad uh, and um, without having to travel to the borders or to these countries of uh, supply uh, because uh, international travel is still not possible up to now. So to a large extent, uh, informal cross-border trade uh, has been affected. Thank you, Sydney. So I think we are coming to the end and um, if I was to conclude what I have had is that most of the questions were asking things that we need to do as a continent that Korea has already done. And I think um, what um, we heard from uh, Mr. Park is a sort of the aspirational space where we want to be as a continent if we are to make good use and full utilization of the, of the AFCFTA. So I hope um, through this uh, session, we've been able to see a high benchmark, uh, see the progress that Zambia is making, uh, got encouraged by the conclusion from Sydney that most of the things that they have done have become, are becoming permanent and hopefully they are going to be captured into, into law. And then, of course, we have had uh, some of the legal things that we need to do based on what Stephen has, uh, has added if we are actually going to, 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 to move forward. So, Bronwyn, uh, with this, I want to bring to an end uh, this session of mine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, for that robust session. We have got a couple of questions that I will defer to the next session. Uh, Evelyn, I'm speaking to you. Uh, we'll definitely get you to participate in uh, the next panel discussion. And then um, I'll also kick off with Acha, Jacob, Akul, with your question. Um, but let's just get the, the other panelists ready. And of course, the, the next section is measure for business sustainability and continuity um, and tested investment climate reforms for attracting investment in the COVID-19 era. And we've heard this theme over and over again today. We need foreign direct investment to catalyze that uh, intra-Africa trade, to build out our infrastructure, to create the right platforms uh, across which to trade. Um, it's now my pleasure to ask uh, Acha Leke, who is a senior partner at McKinsey and Company, to take the next part of the discussion forward. I know that um, Eunice Houston is having some technical issues at the moment. Uh, he will join us at some stage during the session. So until he does, uh, Acha. Eunice is on. 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 Eunice is
Oh, is he on? All right, fantastic. Sorry, I was trying to monitor that news flow. He said his system had crashed, but great to have Yunus Houston on. He's the head of National Investment Agency, South Africa. Also, on Yeka Ukuma, who is the former CEO of Farm Crowdy, and Edem Zogenu, who is Afro Champions. So, Acha, always a pleasure to see you on the stage. And uh, just before we get into your session, that question from Jab Jacob Akur. Uh, saying, how will the AFC FTA empower startups in the tech sector in Africa to enable them equally to build resilient and cutting edge trade facilitation softwares akin to that of KCS for widespread use? So if you can interject that into your discussion, that would be great. Over to you, Acha. Thank you, Bronwyn. And uh, let me start by thanking the African Development Bank for organizing uh, uh, this event. Um, uh, I, I do wonder if uh, Onyeka is on, because I think I've seen Yunus and I've seen Edem. Yes, I'm on. Oh, you are? Okay, 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 perfect. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure. So all my panelists are here. So thank you. Uh, and, and, and like Bronwyn said, this session is really talk about the private sector, right? So we've talked about policy, but I think part of what we need on the continent, as we know, is to attract more private investments and to help uh, grow the private sector in a context where as we know, the, the crisis has had an impact on the health front, but also an impact on the economic front, right? And we've seen the numbers around, you know, uh, minus 3.3% growth across Africa. We've seen South Africa and Nigeria already in a recession. Uh, you know, we know the impact. We've seen job losses. You know, we actually thought that at, at the worst case, as McKinsey, we predicted that. We projected that we could lose about a third of our jobs um, uh, across the continent. The good news is I don't think we're going to get there, <laughs> the worst case, right? But we'll come and talk about that and see how it's affected uh, some of the players who are here here with us today. But it's had quite an, quite an impact on, on, on the private sector. Now, within that context, we, we've, we've studied crises around the world over the years. And what we found is that there's always a set of companies that actually do perform better during the crisis. And those who perform better during the crisis tend to do three times better than the competitors after the crisis, right? We call these group, this group resilience. Um, and there are a number of things that they do well. You know, they, they really very quickly focus on taking out costs because that's important to sort of reduce the cost base. They very quickly figure out how to pivot the business to really uh, uh, go after the new opportunities. And they actually engage a lot more in M&A, right? They look at, you know, what can they divest from, what do they want to exit, but also who do, they want, who do they want to buy? So this set of companies uh, uh, do really well during the crisis and even much better post the crisis. And so our message to private sector players is always the decisions you make now are actually fundamental, right? The fundamental to set you up, not just for success now, but for further success down the road. So with that context, let me actually now talk to, uh, move on to, to, to the different panelists. Yunus, let's start with you. You know, you are the head of the National Investments Agency in South Africa. We know how South Africa has been impacted by the crisis. Uh, we've all seen the numbers. Uh, what can you do? What are you doing to try to attract more investments into South Africa? And how uh, is the, the ASTFTA, how can the ASTFTA help you in that respect? Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity. I think from, 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 some, from our perspective, um, we went through a very hard lockdown in South Africa. Um, and we did this through uh, different levels to a risk mitigating strategy. So from our side, I think um, what the president uh, established was through a disaster management act, a national coordinating command council and we fed in uh, practically in what we call the NAT joints as a coordinating council to look at broader economic social issues that impact uh, on, on the economy. So from our side, I think uh, also uh, besides the pandemic, the roles of IPAs or investment promotion agencies has also changed fundamentally. Today, our, our job is more in the level of a very focused aftercare forum uh, to your existing investors uh, in preserving their investment and preser preserving those businesses that are closing and protecting those jobs first. 
I think that's the key key element in any any IPA strategy before you can consider uh, further new investment that in our case there's so because the lockdown has been uh, for such a long period of time and there was inactivity for at least three to four months. So a number of businesses, both uh, multinationals or domestic have been hurting. Uh, so our key focus is to get involved, uh, see how we can work with the private sector uh, to preserve that investment, number one, number two, to preserve those jobs, and then to see how we can expand that. Uh, and looking at uh, the AFCTA, so how we can position South Africa as a regional uh, manufacturing hub to provide industrial goods and to provide a higher level of uh, services uh, into the continent. So I, I think also from an IPA perspective, uh, I've been doing this job for a long time and uh, it, it, it's certainly very different now, is that if, you, if you're in the eye of the investor, uh, because of, the, of this lockdown, there's so many challenges. Investors want the service, investors want the predictability, investors want, or companies want things to be sorted out. Uh, and, if, and what has stood us uh, quite well is that we were given the, the leverage as an IPA to go out and, and sort things out, meet the CEOs. Uh, and then what we did is in terms of the supply chains, the, the disruptability of the supply chains in South Africa uh, and international supply chains, we looked at the healthcare and the food sector. We developed a dashboard to look at where our critical supply chains challenges are, knew exactly what we can do. Uh, I know in the five to six months, we set up at least eight to 15 companies to produce masks. So, at the start of the pandemic, South Africa only produced 6 million masks. Uh, I'm talking about K95. Today, we produce 13 million a month. And those 13 million are produced in South Africa with the requisite standards. Uh, so, so we bumped up. We talked to a number of companies. We worked together with them. We set up the Solidarity Fund and the Business for South Africa. We worked with the private sector very closely. And private sector came to the party with the agility and ability to retool. For example, we never made ventilators in this country of ours, but today we can produce 20,000 ventilators. And this was normal South African companies, OEMs, retool tweaking, retooling, be more agile, be more flexible uh, because government was reaching out to them. So it was a public private sector partnership. And we continue today to work with Business for South Africa. In level four, we did a number of different things. We looked at how we can bring in technical experts to start the production going so they can meet the timelines for the existing investments. And then the president had an investment conference last week, a number of them came forward and said, we will reinvest in the country. So I think it's that kind of level of detail level that you, you meet with investors, you in what you would say in tune and in touch and in time with investors, and that you understand their concerns, understand the issues, they want a listening ear, and more so not only a listening ear, they want you to do things for them and get things done. And if you're able to get things done, then as the uptick comes, it will serve you in a better it, you will be in a better momentum. So I think uh, like that, we, we, the, the National Ventilator Program, we built up critical supply chains in healthcare and in the food uh, supply chain. We went out to all the major retailers, we asked them, where are you importing from? What can you do in terms of supplier development? How can you support local SMMEs? How can we develop a supplier program uh, for you so that we could develop that value chain and ecosystem and be less reliant on imports. So I think for us in the, the last 10 months, I would say significantly day in, day out, we focused on that uh, uh, rather than, than going out for looking at new investment. And, and now we can see as, we, as, as with the economic recovery plan, things are beginning to pick up. Uh, there's a better, better flow, uh, momentum from uh, other investors coming to talk to us in the country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yunus. Wow, very impressive, right? So, you know, examples of very quick pivots, right? Companies that were doing cars and now doing ventilators, uh, a very quick scale up, right? From 6 million masks to 30 million masks. The strong partnership between the 
the the government and the private sector around you know the business for South Africa and a few other initiatives like that, uh, and a focus like you said on the current um, existing investors versus attracting new investors. We know there was an investor conference last week. Maybe a, a follow up question to you is now that you're starting to look at attracting new investors, right? What, what is your pitch to them? Why why should they come to South Africa at this point in time? Look, I think that uh, as you're aware that uh, South Africa is in, is in a difficult pe period of time, uh, but in terms of the economic recovery plan, uh, we have announced uh, some a number of uh, measures in terms of uh, infrastructure being the bedrock of our recovery. Uh, there are new, there's some some very good green shoots, uh, as you said, in, in in this in this pandemic. Besides. Uh, the pandemic. Also, there were issues, there were the number of areas. For example, uh, the digital economy, the way it grew in South Africa, the opportunity provided for startups, uh, how the e-commerce industry has leapfrogged, and you can see that significant players, uh, the likes of your Amazon's, Google, and others, and developing uh, data centers on scale. So that brings about the ecosystem of that uh, particular industries uh, all around the, the, the value chain. So there, there are a number of different sectors that you are now looking at uh, post your traditional sectors uh, that has given us opportunity to attract newer investments uh, in, in, in the number of new uh, special economic zones that we provide a package for, for investors to come into our country. Uh, so these, these are some uh, wonderful opportunities that we, we're looking at. Got you, got you, thank you. Well, we'll come back and talk about some of that and what, what we can learn and how the CFT could help. Maybe let me move on to Onyeka. Um, um, sounds like from Proudly, I heard you, the ex-CEO of Farm Crowdy, um, but I'd love to maybe share with us first, what is Farm Crowdy? It would be great to understand what it is. And let's talk about, you know, how, how, you know, the company fared during the crisis, what worked and what sort of challenges you faced. And maybe the question that, that the panelists, uh, uh, the participants asked around, you know, given, a, a, you know, as, as a startup, how can the continental free trade area really empower you uh, to do even more and expand across the continent? Okay. Um, thanks a lot for having me. Um, so I am still CEO of Farm Crowdy. I was never ex-CEO. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm the founder and I'm still CEO of, of Farm Crowd, the leading the business um, venture from day one. Um, yeah, maybe Broadway had a, had, a, had a different job for you, but, but good to hear you. I, I'm sorry. Well, actually, I, I actually have to apologize is that <laughs> it must be an age thing. I, the founder, I said as former. So my huge, huge apologies on Yeka, oh, just showing my age. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's all good. He's still running the business. Go ahead, on Yeka. <laughs> right. So, um, I mean, at Farm Crowdy, we, we started out initially as a... Um, maybe the biggest crowdfunding platform that came out of Nigeria, but focused on agriculture. That was how we started in 2016. And um, very quickly, we were able to access funding from um, the public market, from, from individuals, private individuals, to fund um, small-scale farming in Nigeria. Our focus initially was on small-scale farming. But as the business evolved over time, we noticed that there was the opportunity to do the same with um, um, other forms of farming. Um, it, there was more to farming beyond um, just raising money for the farmers. So we got into car production, in, uh, trading activities. We started exporting some of the things we're producing in Nigeria, um, organic ginger out of Nigeria to the UAE. We started doing some um, trading activities on our platform. So over time, um, it took us about four years to get to where we are today, but we're excited that we've now evolved from being just a crowdfunding platform um, to now being a technology business that is focused on agriculture. And so that element of crowdfunding, we've ceased to, to, um, to run that operation and have moved it into another business altogether. And now we've now used technology to touch several parts of the value chain that agriculture makes a difference for farmers or people involved in the food value chain. Whether it's in finance or it's in aggregation or it's in marketing or it's in um, technology, I mean, using technology as a bedrock or it's in insurance for, for people in the food value chain 
or even in farm quality foods, which I'll speak to based on what happened during um, the, the, the lockdown that was imposed as a result of, the result of COVID. So this in itself is where farm crowding is today. We're now maybe the, one of the leading technology businesses in West Africa that is focused on developing sustainable solutions using tech in the agriculture space. Um, now coming down into the COVID era, I mean, roughly around uh, the last week of um, February in Nigeria, we had the first case of um, um, COVID in the country. And in March of this year, 2020, um, we had to, the government had to impose um, a lockdown across the country. So interstate travel stopped, um, international travel stopped, as it, were, as it was the case with many other um, countries around the world. But what was peculiar for us in Nigeria was that we have talked a lot about Lagos being um, maybe the largest city, the largest city in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, Nine million people live within the city and over 14 million live around the suburbs of Lagos, making it about roughly 22, 23 million people that live in this city called Lagos. Now, when there's a shock and everyone is forced to stay at home and, and have to um, immediately um, stock up food items. You can, you can only do as much as you anticipate that you will stay at home for maybe in a week or two and then you're out. That was the shock we faced in Lagos. And what happened was that there were people that were stuck in their houses that didn't have food to eat any longer. And you had a situation where over 20 million people were in this situation, irrespective of their class, irrespective of their location. Um, I'm just using Lagos as a point. Now, in Farm Crowdy, we were even in the position where we're trying to connect our staff with um, food items. So we got license to move food items across um, the state. We got license to move food items across the city, uh, moving it to the... Um, uh, markets that were set up across the city to provide um, um, uh, makeshift markets that were set up across the city to provide people access to getting food items. But it was still difficult for them to move around to get this. So what we did was we saw ourselves a place where for over, um, close to 100 people within our team, we had to start getting food items to their homes. And in that instance, we discovered that, hey, maybe we could also do the same for many others that can access such um, during the period of lockdown and, and get food items to their homes. Now, it took us one week. We eventually moved from just being farm proud, that was helping people, connecting farmers, and providing technology for, for people in the food value chain to creating a mobile app that allowed people to now order for food items to get to their homes. In a short while of about 90 days, we had over 3,600 people that had ordered on that mobile app to get food items to themselves across the city. And that gave birth to what we call farm crowdy foods. Um, we also noticed that it was a problem for people to access, buyers and sellers were struggling to get food items um, or farm harvest across um, whether it's the country or people ordering from outside the country. Um, that also gave birth to the second product that came up during that period called Farm Crowdy Trader. And in Farm Crowdy Trader, you will now have buyers of food of um, harvest um, and then the sellers of harvest, which will include maybe farmers or just traders, come on a platform and they're able to now see the pricing, they're able to get information, they're able to make trade happen. And all of this happens on a system that is now open and for people to subscribe to and now start buying uh, I want 10,000 metric tons of maize. I'm able to come on that platform and put it. And a farmer is able to supply that to the aggregation points that is closest to him. And he's able to get his orders off to the buyer. And he's able to get paid within 48 hours. So in our own little way, during the pandemic, these two things became our biggest driving products and became took center stage on what Farm Party was now championing. Today, we've now effectively on our 40th anniversary, which was about um, just a few, a few days ago, um, we launched publicly 
both platforms, amongst other things that we do, but both platforms taking center stage. And we're seeing traction growing significantly for us because the need is there. Now, taking this beyond what Five Credit has done, we want to see such trades connecting into what um, AFCF, the AFCF FTA has come to put in place to see us connecting traders in, in cocoa from Ghana with manufacturers of chocolate in the um, Netherlands and see them trade on our platform and they're able to get um, the right pricing. The farmers are happy, the buyers are happy. Um, you get more value across the food value chain. And this is, these are things that are quite exciting for us. We're now seeing the prospects, yeah. um, not just in Nigeria, but in the rest of Africa and beyond um, um, the continent of Africa. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, congrats, right? These are real, real examples of pivot, as I talked about, so pivots and building resiliency in your business, right? Going, you know, like you said, from, you know, from, from a crowdfunding business first to a technology business uh, focused on agriculture and building this mobile app in a week, right? We actually believe that um, the number of opportunities that come out of a crisis, like as we see in any crisis, um, we think the biggest opportunity is the acceleration of Africa's digital transformation, right? So... So when I look at some of my clients, the transformations that they would have taken sort of two to three years to do has, have now taken two to three months, right? And the companies and the countries, by the way, that were more digitally advanced across the continent clearly fared better throughout the crisis. So it was great, great to see, um, uh, you know, how you've pivoted uh, so successfully. Maybe one follow-on question before I come to Adam for you is, is as you start to think about, you talked about cocoa farmers connected them to the Netherlands, right? Um, we you think about just Africa, right? You know, how do you think AFCA can help you, the CAA can help you, you know, connect better, expand first, expand beyond Nigeria, and then connect better uh, with, with partners across the continent? Okay, so um, the biggest advantage I think for a business like us would see is where we're able to now um, cross trade between countries and have um, um, payment gateways that are, that are acceptable in Nigeria, acceptable in Ghana. And you have systems in place to see that such payment gateways are easy to implement and they're easy to accept. And then um, um, we're able to tap into that particular um, opportunity that that presents. Also, how we deepen uh, participation uh, across the continent for the different players. It's exciting to see that many countries and governments are now open to having this form of participation happen, it immediately allows a platform like Farm Credit to grow its network. I mean, we started with 3,000 farmers. We have 290,000 farmers within our network currently in Nigeria. If, as, as soon as we're able to expand our network to Rwanda, for instance, and we now get, uh, or in Kenya, we get tea farmers, we get maybe 30,000 of them able to trade and because of what um, the AFC FTA has done um, or what it will do for a business like us to be able to um, have almost a singular way of, uh, um, of financial management, um, regulation that is a lot more um, business friendly such that we are, we are not having so much difficulty setting up um, a Nigerian business in the Rwanda and being able to do our business as though we're in Nigeria. And then also finding ways of having cross-border exchange of information. I think with these three main things, um, businesses like us will continue to thrive and we're excited about the prospects of seeing uh, many governments, not just accepting in, in writing, but accepting in principle and putting policies in place to get us going. Awesome, awesome. And I think, you know, that's a lot of what we're seeing, you know, part of the big, the big challenge and big opportunity is the sort of this harmonization of policies across the continent, right? And that's clearly something, you know, the CFTA and the secretary are looking at doing more and more. And we're seeing that even in, in vaccines today, we're all excited about, about you know, the, the COVID vaccine that, that's on its way. But the big yeah. question, and we're doing some work as McKinsey, we're doing work with the Africa CBC on this to sort of develop Africa's, you know, vaccine strategy. Right. But the big question is, first, how do you fund it? Right. Let's figure out how we fund it. And we're working with Africa's in bank and a number of players on that. But then also, how do you quickly register it across all of our markets? Right. If we're going to leave it to every single country to try to go through that process, how long is that going to take? Is there one way to do it more at a continental level? 
and then have that applied. Uh, so, so that this, this harmonization of regulations will definitely be something that I'm sure will, would help you as well as you expand across the continent. Adam, let's come to you. Um, you know, I won't pick on my friend uh, uh, Bronwyn and call you the you know the former founder of the Afro Champions Initiative. Uh, but I guess you're Okay, we know each other well enough for us not to play this game. I have uh, <laughs> humbly apologized. And, and I'm not up for champions that. either, because he just says up for champions. So. He says up for champions. Okay, let's let you tell us what you are. You tell us what you are, and then and then tell us again about um, the initiative. Right? I'm not sure everybody here knows about the initiative. What the issue is about, and what role does the you know the Africa Continental Free Trade Area play in helping you expand that initiative? So, so I'm going to zoom into it, but I will try also to, uh, if I'm given uh, sharing rights, to be able to uh, maybe speak a little bit about uh, what, what, what we're doing on, on the Afro Champions front. Uh, I don't know if you can, uh, if I'm allowed to. I, I, I don't know who gives sharing rights, but, but as you do that, maybe just start talking because we only have about 15 yes. minutes. Okay, so... Uh, Okay, so I'll, I'll go on and start talking then. Uh, Afro Champions minutes. basically is an initiative that uh, uh, grew out of the understanding that the African private sector has massive capacity uh, in driving cross-border uh, operations through its investments, mainly from uh, the medium and small-scale enterprises, but just need a capacity to be able to ride on the back of the multinational... Sorry, sorry sir, you can't share your, uh, your document. Uh, no, it's fine. So right on the back of the multinational... Are you sure, Adam? Because it's all set there for you to go, Your okay. the document you want to share. Okay, let me... Go ahead, because you wanted to from the from the outset. Okay. There we go. We're seeing your screen right now. Okay, that's good. So I, I, uh, we grew out of the perception that the private sector has capacity. Most people tend to look at Afro Champions as a public-private sector association. But we're not. What am I, sir? We are, we are a multi-stakeholder organization with a focus towards driving economic Sir, growth. you can hear me, please? So a it's, lot of our stakeholders are- It's possible the you put the, the PowerPoint in Diaporama mode, please? Adam, Sorry, can, what, you put, Sorry, can you put the PowerPoint into PowerPoint mode, i.e. that it will share um, as, a, as a PowerPoint presentation? There we go. We've got it. You've got it? So we, we, well, got we don't it, see yeah. it anymore. Do you have it now? No. Oh. I don't see it anymore. No, no, don't, no. Let, let's, let, let, let's not worry about it. So, okay, fine. Go, Adam, just go ahead. Then. So we're, we're, we're beyond a multi, we're, we're, we like to see ourselves as a multi stakeholder organization uh, because we have private sector champions, we have public sector champions, we have former leaders, we have current leaders. Uh, we have SMEs, so we think we're an amalgam of just people and institutions that believe in economic integration and seek to find projects or initiatives that are key to driving that integration. Uh, and, and that's the approach and spirit with which we took to the, uh, uh, the African Union uh, and became a technical partner with the African Union, because we think that a lot of public sector organizations do have power to do things, the capacity just doesn't exist within the, uh, to be able to help them do that. So with the African Union, when the COVID epidemic came, one of the first things we did uh, was to work with the African Union to create, a, as part of the task force COVID, to create a uh, COVID response fund uh, and, and to ensure that we brought in the right trustees, the right private sector partners uh, to be able to ensure that we didn't have a situation where we had multiple funds in different countries, which will exist, but looking at the supranational authority that the AU had, there was a need for us to create a fund where the guy on the street and the president of, say, South Africa are putting money in the same fund that will be used to purchase the PPEs uh, or the things that we we'll need in countries that are of need. So we have a situation now where we've been able to push to have countries like uh, Kenya manufacturing 100,000 PPEs a week, I mean, a day, and, and using some of these funds uh, to provide the kind of support uh, for those industries that had pretty much lost their jobs. So the first thing was the fund. Uh, the second thing we did was because we saw CFTA as the key for driving this economic integration, we looked at all the things that could stop CFTA from, uh, uh, could derail CFTA. 
and we, 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 we bundle them into projects and initiatives that we, we decided to bring the capacity to support. One of that was free movement of goods and people. I mean, there's no way we can talk as much as we want about trade and investment, but without a safe, what COVID has taught us is that without a safe corridor, public health corridor, without a safe environment in which we people can move safely and smartly, uh, we would not be able to move those goods and services. So the first thing we did was to bring African innovators together to create a digital tool uh, and, and, and then went back to the Africa CDC after we designed this pro, uh, product to say, you have a supranational authority to be able to harmonize restrictions across borders, but also harmonize uh, labs and ensure that we have a framework within which labs or tests done in one country could be validated or verified in another. Because currently, as we see, there are different restrictions for different countries, different testing protocols, uh, you know, uh, airlines, not sure of what antigen test services, PCR tests, among other things. So we've designed what we're calling the Africa Trusted Travel Portal, which is now currently integrated labs. Uh, countries are able to populate all the uh, uh, restrictions in them. We programmatize this into the tool, the software, and I'm happy to announce that uh, the first few countries are going to go live next week uh, and more other countries are joining. So all the major labs, all the national labs, all the airlines are currently integrated. And Africa now has a trusted mechanism by which people traveling within the continent can be able to move freely and not have to be doing text six, seven times as they travel through the border. We think that this is the same infrastructure from a public health standpoint that is gonna be very useful for even uh, when vaccines come. We have situations now where yellow card certificates, people are traveling, people generate them on their computers at home. They are not trusted when they get into other countries. We think that with this digitization of the public health system in the registry, uh, and of labs uh, we, with the quality assurance necessary to ensure that each country knows exactly when the test was done, which country is coming from, even as you're crossing land borders, it makes it easier for the continent to move. And also position the continent now to be able to negotiate with the rest of the world on what requirements they require for other people from the other parts of the world coming into the continent. So that was the second initiative. The third one, I'll be very quick, is uh, uh, we looked at also the fact that CFT is very key for driving uh, economic integration, but also building resilience against COVID. So within the Avriva framework, Avriva, it's an initiative we came up with, which is the accelerating virtual resilience for integrating a virtual Africa. Uh, that's how the world is going now. Bioscreening, bio product, I mean, biosurveillance is probably going to be a, the part of the way we move, the way we travel, and trade is all about moving, investment is about moving. How do we get those tourists coming back on the continent? How do we make sure that everything we're providing is back where people are saying that Africans are not testing enough? Where's the data? This is where we think that providing those kinds of investments are gonna be very key into those digital infrastructures. So within that river, we're also working with the CFTA secretariat uh, to build an after, we built an after super app that will be launched on African uh, next week uh, or next two weeks during the summit. So it's a super app uh, that is already connecting to dashboards uh, getting SMEs uh, to be able to create a business registry. And on the back of that app, uh, we're able to now get uh, connect. It's very interoperable. So all of the existing platforms, the dashboards, it doesn't replace any of them. But again, looking at how supranational authorities like the CFTA Secretariat, the AU, et cetera, have a mechanism built within the continent for the continent by which they can interconnect with everything else that exists. So that's also the last one. It's helping the uh, uh, African Union uh, with the trade negotiations that are going. We think that that's also very key for ensuring that the CFTA stays on track because we see CFTA as being uh, our stimulus uh, package against COVID. Uh, and, and what are we doing with the C I mean, with the AU with that regard? Uh, part of the challenge has been people were not able to move around to go and hold negotiations. Uh, and so uh, what we've done is working to customers, bringing private sector support, because as we all know, banks and telcos in the private sector are the most hacked. So the concerns that most uh, uh, governments or member states had, for example, confidentiality, language, uh, data, and all of those things, we thought that bringing in private sector security to build a toolkit that will enable the customization of these virtual platforms, along with the cybersecurity framework and protocols, that will enable everything that we're gonna be doing virtually, whether it's e-commerce, whether it's movement of goods, whether it's, uh, the produce uh, from one country, because every country seems to be approaching what they're doing very well. The yep. problem comes when you have to move from one country to the other. So when yeah. Farm Crowdy wants to now 
connect with Rwanda with those farmers. Then the concerns about data, the, the concerns mm -hmm. about cybersecurity, all of those things come to play. So that's the other work we've been doing with the AU Secretary wow. EU to ensure that there's a cybersecurity framework. Thank you. You, you guys have been clearly very busy. Uh, and so first, thank you on behalf of the continent. Thank you for that. And when I heard about your Africa Trusted Travel Portal, I, I wish it existed. I was, um, I was in West Africa a few weeks ago and I did my test in Togo and I was flying out of Ghana and actually they refused to board me in Ghana because they said they couldn't verify the authenticity of that test, right? So <laughs> I wish the travel portal was existing then and, and all, on, all of these labs were loaded on there. I would not have had to uh, struggle to get out of Ghana. But, uh, but thank you for all the work you're doing. Maybe Eunice, as we, we, we'd love to come back to you, right? And, and uh, each of you, because I'm trying to understand, now we, now we know what you've been doing and you know, all the work you've been doing. Everything that you know, the CFT is going to be you know, operationalized as of the 1st of Jan, as we know. Uh, what is your one ask? If you had one thing, what would you like the, the AFCFTA to do for you? How could it help you in South Africa? What would you like to see happen with the free trade area that would be beneficial to what, to, you know, what you're trying to do in terms of attracting investors into South Africa? Um, thank you. I, I think let me just give one practical example to see how the AFCTA can work and then get to your, 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 your actual question. I think what we're doing in, uh, in South Africa and uh, with uh, colleagues on the, on the continent is that we're looking at an auto pack, an Africa auto pack, for example. So we're working with the automotive industry uh, with, with hubs in Africa. Uh, for example, in countries like Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria. So we're looking at a, a, an automotive pack. So for example, uh, if you look like uh, uh, Ford, uh, Volkswagen earlier on was mentioned on Toyota, the, the, the vehicles could be assembled there in those particular countries and we will help those countries uh, uh, set up those facilities with the OEMs, but the kits will come from South Africa. So it shows that uh, the, the deepening of the value chain on the, on the continent. So uh, those, those, you know, it's, 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 it's intrinsic uh, value added uh, industrialization on the, on the practical example of industrialization on the continent. Now, if you ask me, I can go the whole day of what we need to do in the, on, to make the AFCTA work. But I think that in order for Africa to industrialize, we've got to start harmonizing the, the legal frameworks. Uh, the technical standards bodies need to be harmonized. Uh, the, the, the thing is a single uh, uh, entry uh, movement of people across border. So there are, there are things that beyond the agreement on trade facilitation, uh, which leads to a lot of regulatory uh, administrative issues um, that needs to be solved to make it practically easier for, 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 for business uh, to operate and, to, to, and for people to move on the continent. So as I said, the legal frameworks, uh, investment protection agreements, uh, the, the uh, certificates of origin, it would be great as, as the one colleague said in the previous thing, if you have one single uh, certificate of origin for the AFCTA. It will be a real bomb uh, to to have to make that happen. So, it's it's quite uh, besides the the technical aspects of the agreement, there are a lot of softer things. Uh, the other stuff is the issues of infrastructure and that. But I think there are a lot of softer things. I mean, if you could see between us when we were uh, still up to now, if you look at the Bay Bridge border post, uh, it can take you five days, 14 days to go past. In, in this today and environment, it should be seamless. Uh, so in order to, 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 to get the momentum of real uh, trade and investment, these are issues that need to be practically resolved. Uh, and as I said, if you can get uh, the, the quicker, we can uh, get, uh, for example, to digital one-stop border post, that will make life very easy for everybody. So some of the, the softer things, I think that uh, attention needs to be paid to, to give practical impetus for business to then put down the dollar to say, we can, we can invest in, in, in these countries that we are comfortable. It will give us a safe uh, return of investment. But more importantly, 
the system and the environment will work. And yeah. there's, there's customer service and everybody's happy. Exactly. Very helpful. Th th thank you for that. Nyeka, let me come to you. I think we have a few minutes left before we close. Um, one of the challenges with startups, as we know, is financing, right? You know, raising money. And it's funny because you started actually as a crowd financing platform. <laughs> so we'd love to understand, you know, is there anything that the CFG can help with as you think about, you know, raising more financing going forward? Yeah, I, I think one of the things it can do is um, for businesses like ours, um, it's not just to raise finance, but it's to raise p patient capital. And in, doing, in raising patient capital, you would want to be able to access money for three to five years that allows you to then grow your business and prove a model um, before you're looking at paying back. And there's not so much patient capital, or if there is, um, there's not so much exposure to such patient capital that exists um, within the continent. So one we want to see more and more of this, and especially because if you look at Africa as a whole, um, the real sectors need such. You're talking agriculture, you're talking real estate, you're talking transportation. The kind of funding you need in these sectors are not the type that you will be looking at paying back in six months or in nine months, you, you'll be looking at long-term investments that gives you um, um, low interest rate and allows you to evolve as a business. So that is one of the things I'm hoping this will come out with. The second is um, a exchange of people because in capital, in, in, in um, investment in startups, you, you're not just gonna be looking at cash investment, but human capital investment. And so the exchange of ideas is something I'll be excited about seeing. So where a business say in South Africa has successfully evolved and taken up the challenges of, of um, maybe FinTech for resource or AgTech for instance in their own climb, they can exchange ideas easily with another startup in Nigeria and another startup in Egypt. And so that whole, um, broad stream of being able to connect people so that you're exchanging ideas and building people will invest more in our human capital to make us better. The last thing would be showcasing the successes that have come up. So in, in cases where, for instance, I mean, I'm excited about a friend of mine um, that runs the platform called Paystack that was acquired by Stripe um, recently for um, over $200 million um, in the last um, a um, couple of weeks. Um, that put a spotlight on Nigerian startups in a way that we've never seen before. Because now investors are paying attention to say, what makes, what made Stripe look at Paystack, a five-year-old startup, to acquire it for over $200 million. A startup that is based in Nigeria, a startup that has significantly done a huge part of their business in Nigeria, to get such recognition. I think there should be more spotlight, not just from the investors that come from outside, but within the AFC FTA, we showcase our own homegrown business. And how do you do that? You use the services that are created by the talent within the continent for the things you want to do to solve situations, to solve problems in the internet and reduce how much you import talent or you use how much you import solutions from outside the content. So, for instance, what Adam is saying that he's doing with his own solution should be something that the spotlight is placed on so that governments are looking at how to use Adam's solution as against getting one from America or from Europe to solve our own problems and showcase our talent. That is how we put spotlight on our talent. And that's how we grow the value of our businesses. That is how we continue to encourage even more young people to get excited about building the solutions that they know that eventually will make them successful business people right here on the continent in Africa without having to leave the shores of this continent. So I think those would be three things I would, I would um, use. Absolutely. Thank you. And I love the idea of, you know, how do we leverage more of our local solutions, right? Because um, we know that in general, so in many cases, that's not the case, right? We go and import solutions when you have people locally who can do them and do them just as well. So thanks for, for pushing on that. And then let's, let's conclude with you. Right. Um, you know, you've clearly been involved across the board, across many of these initiatives. I was going to ask you what next, but I was going to feel like you're going to give me another list of four or five initiatives that you're doing. But maybe maybe just help us think to if there's one thing that you'd like to see as a 
uh, AFCFT is operationalized starting in January? Is there one thing you'd like to see them focus on to really help bring the continent together? What is that one thing you would, you, you would suggest? I think it should be... Sorry. Adam. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Okay. No, sorry, Adam, thank you. Okay. No, I think the uh, AFCFT has to uh, focus its attention on the small and medium scale enterprises mm -hmm. uh, because that's where a lot of the economic activity takes place. Uh, and choreograph the ability to ride on the back of uh, the multinational uh, players and become relevant globally. Uh, the example that was given by Frank Crowdy, I mean, these are all things that have been done without the strategic support of policy uh, and also with government. Uh, and so we believe that partnerships is going to be very key. No single institution can do it. We just need to hold hands and do it together. Uh, and working with institutions like the AU, the CDC, the RECs, and also DFIs, like the AFDB and other international partners, we are going to be convening the first global convening of uh, the Africa Trusted Travel is now going global. It's called the Global Haven because international organizations, countries have reached out and seen what Africa started. And now it's reaching out to Africa to say, how do you share your example to the rest of the world? So my challenge to the SCFTA Secretariat is that you know, we just need to we seem to be united uh, and working with the key stakeholders that are important in driving integration. And when the rest of the world sees Africa as united, however embryonic in these stages of development it is, uh, it gives us a better footing in being able to be able to sit at the table and be competitive globally. Thank you. And even on finance, if I may just add, uh, you know, we will be also launching our uh, Opera Champion Fund that is focused on purely CFTA. So it's a CFTA accelerated fund out of the trillion dollar framework that was approved by the heads of states in the last summit. And uh, we've done a lot of work in that and we'll be starting our roadshow uh, in the first week of December. So more, to, more, more on that later. Thank you. Oh, very cool. Well, good luck with the fund. And, uh, and thanks to all my panelists for this uh, really interesting discussion and on what the private sector is doing, I think what we can take from this is we're doing already a lot, right? There's a lot that the African private sector is doing. There's a lot more we can do uh, as the CFTA becomes operational and, and supports the scale up and the growth of the private sector and the expansion across Africa. So on that note, uh, thank you to my panelists and Bruno, I'll hand over back to you. Thank you. Acha, thank you very much. Before you and your, your panel stand down, I do just want to open to Evelyn, uh, who had put her hand up earlier. Uh, Evelyn, if you would like to address your question to the in your mic from a technical perspective, if you are still on the line, just give you a minute to respond. I don't see any movement from Evelyn. Do you, Acha? No, I don't. Then there's also just uh, another question coming through on the chat box, um, and that is from Injong Nabe, Christoph Injong Dan. Um, to date, no solution oh, is envisioned. Sorry, brother, Evelyn says she's here. Evelyn, know, Evelyn, do, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Please go ahead and unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Evelyn and I'm a PhD student in economics. Currently, I'm living in China, but I'm from Tanzania. My question uh, is general. So I don't know if you can answer in this session or people from session one. Um, the most important uh, point that I got from this meeting is that the COVID-19 has reduced um, the interdependence between countries. Like it has like given us a wake up call of being independent, especially in production and distribution, because we have seen uh, so many obstacles uh, during trade during pandemic. So my question is to the African, uh, African government, uh, before we start thinking of developing in the, I mean, new industries or attracting more investors, we already have the 
existing industries, such as the firms which are in the export processing zones in most of the parts of the Africa. And most of them, they have just been listed as they're there, but most of them, they are not operational. Most of them, they are not really operating. Uh, evidently from Tanzania, I did my study there. I actually visited some of them. They've been there maybe for 10 years. They are listed as uh, companies which are there, but uh, eventually they're not working. And most of the challenges they're saying is like, um, they don't have the machinery, they're just given the area, but no equipment. So they, they need a lot of capital to continue with the production. So I'm asking the African governments in general, what plan do they have first to uh, mitigate or to solve the problems of the existing, already existing industry uh, before focusing on um, adding more industries so okay. that we can become independent okay. in uh, production distribution. Thanks, Evelyn. Maybe, I mean, I guess the only government person here would be Eunice. So maybe Eunice, if you can help. I think Eunice addressed it a bit where you said you focus initially just on the existing investors before attracting new. But can you talk about how you think about industries, right, versus focusing on existing industries before trying to expand the, um, the, the space to other, other new potential industries? Maybe I can, can just come in. I, I think the government's role is to provide uh, the infrastructure. And government's role is to provide, in this case, it would be industrial parks or special economic zones. I think then it's the, the role of both the, the private sector and government, uh, and maybe through DFIs to provide uh, loan funding or grant funding in the, in the government says to enable the companies to, to to get uh, working capital or trade finance or uh, acquisition of machinery and so forth. So I think it's 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 a combination of uh, how you how a country would develop its uh, industrial policy, which areas it wants to develop in terms of its economic development, and uh, depending on what the, the fiscal package of of a of, of country is to provide uh, that to to attract uh, companies to invest in. But more, 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 I think the longevity of, of companies is that there has to be a supply chain associated or an ecosystem associated with a particular sector for them to, to survive, for them to grow, uh, and then for them to, to, to become from small to, to bigger business. Equally important is the opportunity that they will provide to, to local communities or local investment, uh, particularly for, for SMMEs, startup, youth, women empowerment. These, these are important elements when you go into to areas uh, in terms of investment uh, or economic development. Uh, in, in, it applies across the board in, in any area that you go to. Uh, that these are, these are, to do these kind of things are be, become successful ingredients for for an enterprise to, to, to thrive in a particular location uh, uh, in, in, a, in a particular province or, or country. Thank you. Thank you, Anas. Bronwyn. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, uh, Acha, I know that you're gonna leave us at this stage. Yeah, thank you. All right, and, and appreciate it. Thank you very much to you for such a dynamic session and to your panelists. Um, it's my pleasure now to, to call on Sanyong Park, again, Assistant Director in Information Planning Division, Korean Customs Service, Korea Customs Service, just to make a, a closing comment. Sanyong, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, uh, we also understand the share uh, uh, understand and share the concerns about the economic downturn because of the uh, COVID-19. Uh, my presentation today was about uh, Korea's e-clearance system. May, and uh, it may yeah, sound a little bit distant in current situation uh, and in uh, this atmosphere, but looking back into the Korea's uh, experience, one of the important things in economic growth is trade and investments. And in the center uh, is the uh, e-clearance system. Uh, non face to face uh, administration will become the new no new normal uh, in the post covid 19 
uh, uh, well, uh, era. Uh, the KCS is committed to sharing our experiences in developing uh, the contactless environment within uh, African countries. And um, uh, uh, people say uh, crises also uh, present opportunity, present opportunities. The KCS hopes that the COVID-19 crisis will become a new opportunity for, for Africa to expand to the global market. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sun Yong. Much appreciated. It's now my pleasure to call on Ando Mensa, who is the Manager, Trade and Investment Climate Division of Policy Industry Trade Department, PITD2, at the African Development Bank. And Ando, if I could ask you to come up and close the uh, the webinar that we've enjoyed today. I just do want to borrow before I hand back to you from a statement that uh, Trudy made earlier. Oh, it was actually Annabelle who came forward with a lovely quote from President Paul Kagame, uh, President of the Republic of Rwanda. Promise of free trade and free movement is the promise of prosperity for, for, uh, for all Africans. And I think today has gone a long way to looking at how we can catalyze the opportunities from the pandemic to accelerate trade and investment across the African continent, leveraging the Africa, the African Trade Continental Free Trade Agreement. Ando. Thank you very much, uh, Bronwyn. Um, I'd like to um, thank uh, very much all our panelists, all our moderators, uh, on behalf of uh, uh, my vice president and my director uh, for, 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 for honoring our invitation uh, and for really uh, making this uh, a, a resounding success. The high costs of COVID-19 are evident in lost jobs and dramatic falls uh, in GDP growth, uh, compromised value chains, policy, business, and much more. Uh, but we also know that uh, um, as, as the, in a statement by the VP delivered by uh, Mr. Mukta, uh, in the midst of every crisis, uh, always stand some opportunities. So today we set out to uh, discuss this subject discuss how to retool, how to restart uh, from crisis to trade and investment. And, um, you know, the, everyone who was called upon uh, to, to deliver or to uh, share their opinions have really, uh, really done justice to the, to the subject. We have, we, you know, there were so many things, a wealth of ideas that came out in the last two, three hours diversification of value chains, industrialization, focus on the AFCFTA implementation. And a lot of people, uh, I think it was Trudy or Annabelle that says, make it happen. That's a really strong message uh, that we should take. Um, as I went through the chats and the question and answers, I saw something very interesting. Somebody said, the AFDB, the Knowledge Factory. Um, I thought that was really, really strong. Uh, the African Roman Bank as the Knowledge Factory. And I think that's what we set up to do today. Uh, not only to, to, to share knowledge, but also to find additional knowledge uh, on this subject that all of us as, uh, on the continent can use uh, in addressing the challenges that COVID uh, presented or has, uh, has presented to us. So the question is, COVID really uh, changed Africa. During COVID, uh, we saw um, uh, automobile factories being turned around to produce ventilators. We saw countries producing um, hand sanitizers from cassava starch. I believe that was in Zambia somewhere. Uh, we saw Senegal producing $1 test kits. Uh, you know, we saw countries coming up with so much to really address the crisis and, and, and you know, sustain uh, its people, uh, both from the disease and also, uh, you know, sustain the economies. 
So why not we take advantage of this, um, you know, uh, uh, ingenuity that we have shown as a continent when COVID came through? Um, this is the message that I like to point to everybody, that Africa can do it uh, because we saw what happened during COVID. Everybody's hands were on board. And uh, I believe that is the spirit that we set out to really discover through this uh, discussion. At the bank, one of the things we have been trying to do, uh, we have known all along that the AFCFTA cannot succeed without the private sector. Uh, listening to Onyeka, uh, we can, you know, I'm, I'm very convinced that we are right that uh, the private sector should go along in the, you know, the implementation of the AFCFTA because um, that is where success lies. The teaming up private sector with AFCFTA is a must. And I'd like to thank on behalf of my VP and I director again, uh, thank you very much all our, our, our moderators, our panelists, uh, you Bronwyn for gluing this together to, throughout the, uh, the, the last few hours we spent together. And most of all to my team, uh, to our interpreters, to uh, the communications department of the bank, uh, to our indefatigable partners in Korea, KCS, uh, everyone whose hand was in this to make it successful. We thank you and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you very much. <laughs> right, thank you very you. much, Andrew. Thank you. And uh, I just want to say another thank you to the Korea Customs Service uh, jointly with the African Development Bank for bringing us to this thought leadership around uh, AFC, FTA, and what we can do uh, given our COVID-19 reality in terms of accelerating investment and intra-Africa trade across the continent. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much for your time. Bye bye. Yuna, <coughs> Yuna, Yuna, please. Um, can we? And I just want to make a, a brief statement now. If we could all just uh, put our cameras on for a picture, please, um, before we log off. If all the panelists could put their picture on for a, a picture. Um, uh, I think everybody, right, please. Um, I, you know, everybody uh, should put on their picture if it, if you can, please. It, it would be great. We'd like to uh, have a good record of this uh, day. <laughs> great. Have we got pictures on? Maria, your ca Maria, please. Your camera is not good. You can't detect your camera. You can turn yeah, on now. C'est fait? Deux minutes, monsieur. OK. OK, on, on prend la position, le maximum. OK. 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 Une... All right. La dernière avec Marie. C'est bon. Merci beaucoup. Thank you for the honor. Merci, Siaka, your IT team. We are grateful to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.